Sorry, real real boomer energy here. Oh, it's totally okay. fine. Full screen and display. Okay, all right. So uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, probably my uh, my favorite. There's actually this book about European history by this guy named Norman Davies, and it's just really interesting. Did you say history? Yeah, yeah. I really I really find that uh, I really find history really interesting. You know, and European history is, I guess, uh, you know, apart from American, maybe the most interesting to me. But it's also interesting because it so I guess is innately tied to the rest of the world too. I mean, Europeans did spend a, a yeah, good think- five hundred years. Uh, colonizing and subduing the rest of the world, so in the process, they've really put their put their stamp on on the rest of the world too. And uh, yeah, the book is called Europe by Norman Davies. That's just the the title, Europe: A History by Norman That's Davies. Cool. So, yeah. What's a? I, I haven't even started the interview yet. But what's a, your opinion on colonization? Like, I don't even know what the standard idea is. Like, uh, with uh, within the neolib form of thought. Uh, you know, uh, colonization is uh, pretty cringe. You have the colonization really is typically just another form of, of a military conquest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suppose you could, you know, you can make, uh, I think some, you can quibble around the edges with some uh, colonization by settlers and territories that were not exactly clearly owned or, or, uh, you know, things like that. I, I suppose, you know, it would be hard to argue that, that uh, there was no, uh, that, that, that nobody had any right to uh to to settle kind of unsettled territories in the past but generally speaking the idea of colonization certainly as it was practiced in the 19th century where europeans just conquered countries by force uh, and then integrated them into colonial empires that's pretty pretty cringe that's pretty bad uh and generally speaking i think that the Europeans who might try and defend that legacy are uh, sort of at the level of those uh, communists who would defend Stalin or <laughs> those Nazis who would defend, you know, what happened in German occupied Poland. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, especially when you think about like British India, where millions of people starved to death repeatedly in famines that were yep. exacerbated by the actions yep. of the state or the worst colony, as far as I know, that ever existed, the Belgian Congo, not, uh, not the Congo. Uh, owned by Belgium, but the Congo owned by the King of Belgium prior to its annexation by Belgium. And that's an important distinction to make because this, this Congo free state, as it was called, um, millions of people died for the purpose of an economic system that forcibly extracted rubber, basically at gunpoint from people who had never troubled uh, Belgium or the outside I'm impressed. You know your history, like for sure. Yeah. The, yeah. you pretty, know, the- pretty awful. The the Belgian Congo situation is like people hate so much on imperialism of the British. I mean, obviously yeah. it's bad, but holy shit, yeah. did you know yeah. the Belgians give them a run for their money? Um, yeah, for sure. There's a there's Belgium, an amazing yeah. book on it called King Leopold's Ghosts, um, yeah. which is a big book in historiography, and they they talked a lot about um, you know the story of how that kind of got discovered and unveiled and all that stuff. Yeah, really that's gruesome stuff. The British certainly were the most successful with the uh, painting the map, but they, uh, I, I think that in terms of concentrated terror, nobody comes close to the Congo Free State. And maybe Germany. Germany uh, had very few colonies, but... Spain the had their moments. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Pretty, 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 uh, pretty bad. But I think Belgium probably in terms of, uh, you know, proportion of uh, horrors inflicted on the colonies it had. I think Belgium, uh, um, particularly King Leopold, has to take the kick as uh, as the worst. So that being said, there are some people who argue that colonialism, for example, advanced the subject countries by building infrastructure and by building, uh, you know, maybe by improving literacy rates somewhat. But mm. you, I think, have to reckon with the reality that those are the exact same arguments that somebody who says the USSR was a good thing, you know, will make. Yeah. And, if you are prepared to say it is okay to achieve some, you know, uh, uh, human progress is a okay, um, even if the state kills, you know, ten million people in the process, it's it's worth it to up those literacy rates a little bit. Hey, you know, that's a, that's a pretty terrible argument. And beyond that, I think that it's actually it actually seems like colonialism uh, helped. Yeah, it's why I don't like the term progressive. Because, yeah. like, the term progressive, like, even though I know, like, yeah, most of the people who call themselves progressives don't have this attitude, but it just rings, it reminds me of what, pro- like, the idea of being a progressive historically, especially from a European perspective and how that's often being used for bad shit. Um, we should get started, like though. Oh, 
Out of curiosity. Uh, um, uh, I mean, like the European Enlightenment, um, mm-hmm. the the positives of it obviously led to people, amazing philosophers like Voltaire and et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. But the consequences of it, it also led to, you know, our modern scientific, pseudoscientific ideas of race, um, you know, black, mm-hmm. white, and all the categorization assigned with that and scientific racism, which obviously led to Nazism and eugenics and all yeah, that shit. I, I, I get you that you could say that None of that would have happened without without that. I guess I would just say that I think there's a difference between something that uh, something that can lead to bad outcomes and something that almost invariably does, mm-hmm. you know, reliably lead to bad outcomes. And for me, for example, I think colonialism generally, you know, leads to pretty terrible outcomes. Communism typically leads to pretty terrible outcomes. Progressivism in its various forms can lead to pretty terrible outcomes, but I don't think in the same way that say communism or colonialism does. You know, almost guarantees it or guarantees them. So, I I want to debate you on the communism thing, but I am definitely not educated enough to do that. But I I will prepare one day. Right. I'm working That's on fun. my monarcho communist anarchist theory. Um, wow, it's still you know in the works because there's we're having some problems with logic there because it seems very hmm. rational. So I'm still I'm still working out the kinks to make it make more sense because right now it doesn't make any sense, but yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. And then we Monarcho, communism, anarchism. Oh, yeah. So it's where yeah. okay. the monarch guarantees the right. Um, it's, first of all, it's where everyone's equal under the monarch. And mm-hmm. it's where the monarch guarantees the right for everyone, um, you know, to live according to their own self-determination and all that huh. stuff. Um, That's like, uh, and it's got great uh, aesthetics. Oh, I believe I believe it's got the aesthetics. That sort of reminds me of the uh, <laughs> reminds me of the uh, you know Liberty Hangout people or the uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe people who say that you know true freedom is not really possible without a monarch to protect us from the the whims of the democratically uh, you know the the democratic minded plebes who just oh would, yeah exactly you know, eliminate our freedom with the, through the ballot box. Sorry, I don't mean keep keep no, stopping. <laughs> But yeah, let's get started properly with the interview. Um, uh, hey everyone, I'm Aristocracy, spelt with an E, not an A. Um, and I am a history streamer. I like doing interviews, just like you know what, how I'm interviewing Bastia today, um, where I find people interesting twice a week. And otherwise, I do normally like history kind of content. Um, if you guys have any questions for Bastia, um, put them in the chat. I'll try my best to get to them. And um, yeah, so. Today we have Bastia. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little about yourself? Wait, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh. sure. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so my name is Bastia. Thank you for the introduction. Very, uh, very kind of you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I am a streamer on Twitch.tv, a prolific tweeter on Twitter.com, and I talk about liberal ideas. I am the duly elected chief neoliberal shill, elected to that position by uh, thousands of people who were very kind enough to vote for me in a very close election. And I uh, enjoy talking about politics and history and a little bit of law, although I actually don't do much law on my stream despite being a lawyer because I generally don't want to do, uh, you know, I generally don't do legal takes off the cuff. You know, you don't want to get that stuff wrong. But uh, I uh, enjoy the uh, chance to talk with people. And so thanks for having me. What kind of lawyer are you? I'm a corporate lawyer, so I don't know anything about criminal law, but I know a little bit about corporate law. I I still think that you would probably know more, at least, than the average person. Um, I do my best. <laughs> do your best. Yeah. Um, so why did you? Actually, you know what? I'll ask that question later with the corporate lawyer stuff. But uh, what sure. got you into into streaming? Uh, well, I saw Destiny do it in uh, 2019, and I enjoyed watching that, and I thought, you know, this could be a fun hobby. You know, I can probably give this a try. And so I gave it a go, and at first I played uh, I played video games, like I played Stardew Valley, and I yeah. would just kind of stream that to, you know, one or two people, and then... It didn't strike me have a Stardew Valley player, but I, you know, I'm digging well, it. Yeah. It's fun. You know, I haven't played it in a while, but now I kind of have a, I guess, bad association because I, I, I remember Stardew Valley with the uh, bad old times where I had to beg people to watch my stream so I would have someone, anyone to talk to while I was doing it. 
now I'm fortunate enough to have at least a couple people who will come in and, and talk to me. That makes it fun. But it, uh, you know, it's fun. Uh, and uh, I did that for a while. I started doing political panels, though, and that's when kind of the stream uh, grew a little bit. And those are a lot of fun. Um, now I do a lot of uh, interviews like, like you do, actually. And that's kind of fun. And we still do an occasional uh, debate panel or an occasional debate as well. But, you know, uh, we, we generally stick to that kind of stuff. It's usually political political type focus. I don't play games at all anymore, actually. So like on, on the stream, at least. So I, I, I think the last game I really played on stream was Portal and I, Portal 2. And that was kind of fun because I never played it before. When so I play games, fun, my views you know. just like dip, you know? Yeah, yeah, same here. And it's hard to it's hard for me to focus too while I'm doing it. Like Destiny does these debates, you know, while he's playing a game. How does he do that? Like, uh, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I watch the game he's playing. And it seems like he's just kind of jumping the character back and forth, back and forth. You're know, not really not exactly playing mm. the game, but you know, maybe that maybe that helps uh, him though, like focus or something like that. I can't do that though. I uh, ruin the game and I'm I'm not talking straight, so I gotta yeah, yeah, I do more of the both. yeah. Yeah, that's my problem. Like when I when I play games, like I get I'm really competitive. So yeah. when I play games, like I'm a super hardcore gamer. Um, yeah. And yeah, what so I take it way. Oh, like um, RTSs, FPSs. Those are both my my bread and butter. I played a mm. lot of Overwatch. Um, I was trying to like you know get really top. Like um, I was trying to get to Grandmaster in Overwatch and you oh. know get super good at that. And I ended up getting to like high master which is like the second highest or i guess it's the third highest rank and i just kind of plateaued and i gave up because oh. i was i was so annoyed man hardcore hardcore gamer yeah but i haven't been gaming as much lately because streaming takes so much time and yes. gaming is a huge suck like of yeah. your time in yeah. general that's true i actually i i used to play games a lot before i streamed like i would play a lot of uh, paradox type games mm -hmm. but uh, you know, like Stellaris. That's uh, that's probably my favorite. Oh yeah, game. I played Stellaris. Recently. It was great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and they're going to do an expansion, so I might might play some more of that uh, soon. But generally speaking, though, I just I don't really do games much anymore now that I do the stream. That's kind of where the, the free time goes. So yeah, if something gets me canceled, it's going to be like screenshots from my Stellaris plays. You know. Oh well, you know, I are guess. you one of those aliens that just like exterminates all the other aliens? Mm. Yeah, I don't even want to talk about what I did. It was really bad. Yeah. Well, you like, know, I fully Solar role played too. Like, I get really into my RTSs. Like, I'm one of the only people I know that, like, with an RTS, that I go like full role play into that like mindset and that mode. Oh yeah, and, yeah. How definitely. so? You're, you're an example because I think I'm. I don't know if I want to talk about it. Don't get me kids. Nah, come really on. Come on. I, well, you know, I mean, you can you can allude without I guess talking about the part where you loaded your tanks with gas shells or something. And, and oh, I'm getting into all the details. I'm just curious what you mean by role playing an RTS. Um, well, with uh, CK3, I'll definitely, I don't know if you play that one. Oh, um, but... oh I, thought, I thought by RTS, you meant like a, you know, a war game as opposed to one of those paradox games. Yeah, yeah, oh, I get what you yeah. mean. Yeah, I know both of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, cool. yeah, I just, I don't know. I, yeah. I get like, I like getting into the mindset and stuff. So when I play something mm -hmm. like CK3, I put my mindset like completely into the mode of like 11th century, you know, man, woman, etc. Yeah um and all the ethics associated with that and yeah it's not that definitely will get you canceled on twitter 100 no, percent. that's true well you know i mean i don't know it's a it's a paradox game i mean you know it is it's just kind of the way the game works i mean it's like you know i guess that's true yeah, um it's an internet simulator so anyway. what uh um what who are some other like streamers that inspired you like i, I guess destiny was an example yeah. um but anyone else uh, he was the only one I actually was really aware of before I started streaming. And, uh, you know, I didn't really watch any of the others except to the extent they would occasionally interact with him. Like, I used to watch uh, Casey Tron sometimes. Um, oh, okay. that, that was, the two of them were basically the only kind of knowledge I had of the uh, Twitch universe prior to prior to streaming. And then, um, you know, I kind of went, went from there. Uh, I guess today the only other streamer I watch much of apart from Destiny is Vosh. I watch him. Mm -hmm. And I occasionally watch um, some of the other political streamers, but that's, you know, not not too much. I'll occasionally watch a debate panel, but I don't really enjoy most debate panels, you know, either doing them or watching them anymore. So I don't I just don't do them very often um, anymore. But sometimes it kind of feels like I'm uh, I, don't know, I, I feel like uh, it, it, they're they're fun when there are lots of conservatives to argue with. But mm -hmm. then it's just kind of. Left of lefties, yeah, it's not as fun. It just gets kind of, you know, it gets kind of 
it's just not as fun. I mean, it's just kind of boring, you know, I mean, cause you're constantly just saying, well, you know, this is this idea I have that I think is practical. And then they're just kind of like, well, that's not good enough. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, Whatever. the moral purity testing. Yeah. Oh. It, whereas, you know, with some conservatives, it's like the election was stolen. You know, no, it wasn't. You lost 60 lawsuits. Yeah. Well, those courts are full of cucks and those cucks are, are you know appointed by Obama? You know whatever. You know much more, much more. You know zip zap, zip zap, mm-hmm. zip zap. You know it's, it's much more fun. I enjoy it. Does it yeah. kind of annoy you to talk to debating with lefties because of like their perspective on neolibs? Like I feel like neolibs are often put into this category of I don't know, like like turfs or something that they're like wow. the most evil of the evil. Um, Maybe. I mean, I think the only people really feel that way are like extremely online though. So, you know, if it's an opinion that's just held by extremely online people, it really doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't like drag me down. Like, like kind of a landlord phobia, like people want to, you know, kill landlords and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and I'm using the word landlord phobia, ironically, not as a, as a real term here, but you know, people who want to do that. I mean, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't, make me feel bad or anything i I rent a uh, small property here and i posted about uh how we were renting this property i posted some pictures of the property because we're real proud of it you know we niced it up and put in some nice furniture and all that and and, um uh, i posted that on twitter because i knew that you know i knew there would be some people who would come out of the woodwork and get real nasty about it Mm -hmm. and i figured okay once they do that then i can use their nastiness kind of as a springboard to meme on them you know get more likes and follows and all that you know you you gotta gotta play the twitter game you know where you can but the uh you know people though who do that stuff it just doesn't matter and it's the same i think with with neolib as a as an insult i think for the most part in the real world i think most people recognize kind of liberal policies as you know one of the acceptable range of policies out there along with kind of conservative policies and maybe the occasional socialist type policy but you know so you know if but people even in view, the real uh, world it feels like people i guess like right now um with like populism and stuff especially when i was seeing characters like um bernie Sanders yeah. and trump um yeah. i mean obviously they're very very different but some of their policies and some of their rhetoric was very similar especially with like protectionism um, oh, yeah. and that so it definitely seemed like they both were moving away from like a neoliberal kind of form of thought and i was wondering mm-hmm. if that if that is like the future of both the Democrat Party and the Republican Party, um, doesn't that kind of like leave neolibs, you know, outside? I think that's probably the future for Republicans. I don't think that's the future for Democrats, though. I mean, one, companies need a place that they can go and deposit their money and you know, yeah. have, have a party that'll, you know, have a party that will, uh, you know, I guess stand up for basic, uh, you know, basic economics in some capacity. Now that Republicans are increasingly abandoning all that with hardcore protectionism, anti-immigration, uh, and kind of this increasing just desire to own the libs at any price, even if that means, say, destroying a private company like Twitter. Or, uh, you know, they, so I, I don't know. I, I think that, that companies are, are uh, in starting to invest in Democratic candidates more than perhaps they did in the past. So that's one reason I, I don't think that I don't think that the uh, socialists are going to have much luck in any attempt to, quote, you know, take the party and make it populist or whatever. That's one thing. Two, uh, it seems like, you know, if if Joe Biden can keep on keeping on, I think he's showing that there's a a robust liberal agenda out there and a a, a robust liberal agenda is possible to to implement. You know, he's not gotten everything he wanted, but he's done a lot so far. I think he's still got a lot. Did you support Joe Biden in the election? Yeah, certainly over Trump. I mean, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there's a universe. What about the primaries? Um, not, not, he wasn't my first choice. I liked, uh, I liked, uh, Mayor Pete. I liked Andrew Yang. I liked, uh, who's I loved Yang. Yeah. Yang yeah. He was Yang. cool. Although in retrospect, I don't, you know, I, I, he had a couple of really cool ideas and a lot of really, you know, kind of, kind of cringe ideas, you know, but he was, you know, I just liked him. He was a cool guy. Seemed like he was, you know, he had some really, I think his flagship idea of a universal basic income is a pretty good one as far as social programs go. But uh, Joe Biden, certainly, uh, yeah, and he really didn't have much to say about foreign policy. Somebody in the chat mentioned that. I really don't think Andrew Yang had anything to say about foreign policy now that, now that I think about it. But in any event, uh, I, I think Joe Biden was a pretty solid candidate, and he you know, he, he won, so that's good, because Trump, I thought, was a disaster. And mm. I 
yeah, I'm I'm glad that the socialists didn't succeed in capturing the Democratic Party. Although apparently they've captured the one in Nevada, so I guess we'll see what happens. So you didn't there, like but... Bernie Sanders. What's that? So you didn't like Bernie Sanders. I would have voted for him over Trump, no question, but he yeah. would have been my last choice among Democrats, and it would have been a very sad election to me to have to, uh, you know, that, that feels like, uh, you know, that, that would have been a very sad election. But I still would have, no question, voted for Bernie over Trump. Was that not like, did that make you feel a little lonely as like a dude online? Because it felt like every mm. left uh, lefty online dude like was obsessed mm. with Bernie Sanders. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe a little, you know, just cause there's, you know, not really a lot of people that talk to about it, but at the same time, there are, uh, you know, there are certainly folks like, I guess, destiny for one mm -hmm. and other, other, uh, folks like, you know, irrelevant and, and, uh, people who were, you know, not, not, uh, you know, I guess all in like, uh, drinking the Kool-Aid for Bernie, even if they like some Bernie's ideas. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, affiliate with the, the neoliberal, neoliberal project folks on Twitter and they have a stream on Twitch too. So, you know, there was a little, little core of folks who, again, I think all held the same opinion and that look, Bernie is not, you know, not my first choice and my last choice among Democrats, maybe, you know, but, or one of them, I, I don't know, maybe uh, Tulsi probably, you know, maybe Tulsi's even, you know, worse. I, I don't yeah. Know. I was like... But, but, you know, it, Bernie ain't my first choice, clearly. I don't, I don't want him to win, mm -hmm. but, you know, no question that, you know, compared to Trump, I mean, look, Bernie Sanders, at least, I think Bernie Sanders can be relied on to follow the law and the Constitution. Bernie Sanders is, you know, after January 6th, Bernie Sanders might, might rile a lot of people up to, to protest or whatever, but he ain't gonna rile people up to storm the Capitol. Mm. He's, he's an institutionalist, at least, even if he stands for some things I might oppose. So uh, compared to somebody like Trump, who actively, I think, encouraged sort of, you know, burn it all down. Um, you know, yeah, just... I actually felt like so many, um, I don't know, what was common on the common criticisms yeah. on the left against Trump, they even like the extremist style like criticism on him, I actually felt like they were downplaying, especially in the beginning, um, the level of what he was doing. Like the rhetoric that he used remind me, I'm not I'm not saying that Trump himself is necessarily a fascist, but the rhetoric al already like I put out a lot of red flags to me, um, yeah. just as someone who, who loves history. And it reminded me a lot of that kind of stuff. So I was already um, very skeptical of you know, obviously, like his promises and and you know everything that he was kind of purporting to try to be. Yeah, no, he was he was awful. I mean, he would just um, he, you know, it, it was it was all downhill from the moment he started talking about during the campaign in terms of like being uh, kind of a curiosity, you know, an unknown um, to mm -hmm. being just a genuinely bad guy. I think the the when he announced the Muslim ban during the campaign, and he announced it as the Muslim ban. It was eventually implemented as something else so that he could actually do it versus have it immediately all struck down by courts. But he tried to, to and he campaigned on the Muslim ban, right? So the ban on people based on their religion, terrible. The idea of uh, actively trying to attack not just uh, terrorists, but the families of terrorists, like actively going out and seeking uh, innocent people to just abuse and attack. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, it just, it was just, that kind of stuff to me was just like where it became very clear, like, you know, it was funny watching him tear up Jeb Bush. It was hilarious watching him run circles around all these, you know, kind of intellectually, ideologically bankrupt uh, Republicans. But, yeah. you know, it, he was just a bad guy. And so I'm glad that he is gone, at least for now, although he may be back. During his um, election with uh, um, with Hillary Clinton in 2016, the, uh, at one point, he literally called for her assassination. And in Canada, like I'm Canadian, um, yeah. and that would have immediately destroyed that would have just destroyed uh, destroyed his entire candidacy like completely i mean we almost our prime minister almost got destroyed like from elbowing someone so like and i think he yeah. i think he said oh second amendment people you know what to do with someone like her um yeah. and uh yeah and it was obviously what he was like insinuating it was really gross but yeah he just yeah. kind of got oh, away with the shit over and over again yeah, he, uh, although, you know, I guess sometimes I feel a little bit better about the fact that Donald Trump is not just kind of your average pop populist. I mean, he'd been kind of a fixture in American culture for almost 40 years before he, he yeah. actually ran for president in a serious fashion. So, you know, there won't really, I, I think it'll be a little while before we have a uh, celebrity billionaire master of popular culture trolling in the same form that we had with Hopefully. Donald Trump. 
you know, hopefully it'll be a little while um, because he really was in, in some aspects really uh, unique beyond just being just being a demagogue, you know, just being, uh, uh, you know, all that stuff. So well, we'll see. Um, what uh, before we get into more stuff associated with like neoliberalism, how would you yeah. define it? Uh, just, uh, you know, I guess liberalism with a focus on market capitalism, uh, free market capitalism as far as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of a squishy situation, but I guess the idea behind it was in the 30s, there were, of course, there were the classical liberals of the time who just wanted a government that was hands off of, of individual freedom and uh, yeah. you know, didn't really want to regulate business and didn't really want to regulate uh, the individual and uh, um, kind of allow and maximize individual freedom. But those systems sort of buckled in, in real ways in the face of you know, the collectivism of the 1920s and the 1930s with the communists and the fascists and all that. And, and so I think um, <clears throat> uh, there was this, uh, there was this uh, meeting in the 1930s. Uh, gosh, I don't know. Say, I can't remember the uh, the Mont Pelerin Society. I have to look this up, but let me pull this up actually. And, oh, the uh, oh, let's see, 1937 Colloquium. Um, I, I just want to just get this right. Yeah, the uh, Walter Lippmann uh, Colloquium was just this uh, this meeting where kind of uh, a lot of leading liberal types just sort of decided we need to construct a newer form of liberalism that rejects collectivism, socialism. Uh, fascism, but also uh, goes a little bit beyond laissez-faire liberalism with no rules or restrictions, mm. and which recognizes that, you know, you have to have a, a strong state that does some key functions, namely, uh, you know, uh, has a big role in social welfare and leading poverty, because ultimately, if people feel like uh, the system under which they, they live does not alleviate uh, some of their acute problems, you know, if, if you have a government, like, for example, the one we had under, uh, let's see, who was it, uh, Herbert Hoover in the 1920s, you know, uh, yeah. right after the Great Depression, where he did, you know, he did take some actions, uh, but, you know, he's not really given credit for some of the actions he's taken, but he was certainly perceived as not taking, you know, many actions yeah, and initially did. very much did not, you know. So, you know, a government like that that just says, well, you know, we'll let the market sort it out while the country is kind of melting down. Well, you know, that's just kind of uh, a government that is basically, despite its own efforts and, and intentions, is feeding uh, authoritarianism because that's the stuff people look to when liberal systems break down. So, so um, you can be, so in your view, you can be a neolib and still support a semi-welfare state, for lack of a better yeah. term. Yeah, I mean, that's the point. Otherwise, you would just be, a, I guess, a, a, a liberal, you know, a classical liberal. The classical liberal distinction mm -hmm. is there to sort of spell out the difference. But yeah, you know, in the, uh, say, in the 19th century Britain, you know, the liberals would have been, uh, you know, for, for uh, uh, you know, get the get the state off my back, you know, as opposed to having, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't present myself as an expert on British politics. That may be a radical oversimplification, but that's the idea of the liberalism of the past, mm -hmm. you know, get the, get the state off my, off my back, you know, let me, as an individual, you know, build my company, build my fortune, direct my own destiny. And the liberalism, I think, of the 20th century recognizes that, look, you can't, you can't stop there for a variety of reasons, but at its base, in response to the uh, collectivism that, uh, that sort of responded to the problems of the Great Depression by saying, you know, what, crack down, central plan, uh, uh, you know, uh, individuals give up their freedom for the good of the state, on and on and on. So... You know, I would support something like, and and the uh, neoliberal neoliberal uh, types from the neoliberal project, who are basically the only people out there who unironically call themselves neoliberal, are the ones who, uh, you know, they or they they certainly advocate for a lot of that. You know, not a social welfare state that does everything, not cradle to grave in every way, but a social yeah. welfare state that at least guarantees you know, a, a basic floor and that that doesn't trap people in poverty, but helps people deal with poverty and and uh, you know helps keep them from uh, acute misery and despair. So you could support, you could be a neoliberal and support like a UBI system. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, the, the kind of example of uh, the, you know, like that would be, I think, a, if you are neoliberal trying to, trying to argue for your ideal welfare state, it would be something more like universal basic income than something like, say, a, uh, a, a, a federal jobs guarantee, 
right? Yeah. The federal job guarantee involves a ton of, uh, a ton of, and of course they all say, you know, with all these kind of socialist type ideas, no, 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 it will all be local and democratic and on and on and on. But I'm very skeptical of that. Uh, yeah, and either way, it involves a lot of government planning, probably chiefly federal planning, but either way, a lot of centralized government planning uh, that tries to substitute itself for markets, which generally speaking, we think is a bad idea. Not always a bad idea. Sometimes there's situations where that's your, that's your least bad option, but it is often, I would say it's typically a bad idea to try and substitute planning by government for, for markets. Um, but yeah, you know, instead of something like a, a jobs guarantee that seeks to and in fact, subsidize people by creating jobs for them. Um, you know, we would just subsidize people by giving them cash. You know, either way, the money comes out of the tax base, or it's you know printed or, or borrowed yeah. or whatever. And so, the real question is, you know, what are you? Why exactly are you creating jobs for people instead of giving them money and helping enable them to go find jobs for themselves? And you know, they, they give a lot of you know they give a lot of reasons for that. But generally speaking, we would rather the individual make that decision. Uh, and that if, um, if we're going to have welfare, then it should, it should not be designed, uh, to achieve outcomes, I suppose, beyond helping individuals to achieve their own outcomes, you know, like instead of trying to do something like set up a jobs guarantee where we're going to, you know, imagine that if we plan this out right, not only can we help people, but you know, we'll, we'll get some, uh, you know, we'll get some solar panels out of it, you know, because we're going to have them do solar panels and you know, we're going to have them build renewable energy and highways and, you know, all this stuff. And no, 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 don't, don't plan all that, that uh, kind of stuff out. Don't use people who are in need as your tool of uh, development in your chosen direction. Just give them money to alleviate the problem of poverty, which is ultimately one of the things Andrew Yang said that I like, a problem of cash and not a problem of character. You know? Yeah, so like why... So it seems like it's such a strange combination to me, I guess. And that's why I would help, it would help if you help me understand it. Um, yeah. Where you support complete deregulation de of, um, like, of, uh, you know, um, corporations and stuff by the government, right? No. Not, I don't not completely? Think there's much of, no, I don't think there's much of anything I would say I support complete deregulation of. There are things okay. that I would, I would support less regulation of, but complete deregulation implies a lot. It implies that, for example, the government will do nothing, will have no role. And that is- Well, you know, less than what things. the United States has right now. That's what okay. I'm saying. Less than what the United States has right now. Now, so I, you know, that, I have no doubt that's what you meant, but I feel like it's important to spell it out because of course, mm -hmm. you know- No, of course. That, that, it sounds very different, right? And so uh, there are some things that we would want to have government do less of. Like for example, government right now, uh, is very much involved at the local level in particular in zoning decisions. They will, uh, they will decide that you can build such and such size home on land that you own uh, based on where that land is located. So they will say, for example, that in this part of town, you can only build single family housing. You can't build a duplex or a quadplex or a four-story apartment. You can't do that. You can only build single family housing. And that's a problem because that means that you can't, one, it's an individual freedom problem because it means you can't use your land uh, to, you know, in the way you see fit. So that's, that's a problem to me, right? Now I recognize that there are, uh, are, are good reasons to limit that, uh, that what would otherwise be an absolute freedom somewhat to use your property as you see fit. There are some reasons to limit that based on health and based on safety, right? But if you can't make a justification based on health or based on safety, then I think uh, I think your regulation should be somewhat, you know, at least somewhat suspect. And sure enough, it turns out that a lot of decisions that are made by government with respect to zoning are not designed to protect anybody's health and safety. They're not designed to, for example, keep a waste plant away from a residential neighborhood, which of course, uh, anybody would support a regulation like that, but instead these kind of single family zoning, and I'm just hammering as this, uh, you know, as one, as one example, this is why I'm hammering on it. These kinds of zoning restrictions are used to maintain neighborhood character, right? And what does neighborhood character often mean? You know, oh, you think certainly it's like doesn't a just mean... dog whistle for racism. <laughs> yep. That's one, that's one thing, uh, historically it's been used for is to keep neighborhoods white, you know, keep neighborhoods, uh, black, keep the people who don't belong in this neighborhood in that neighborhood. So that's one thing. Um, another thing that is used for is to protect people's property values, right? And why would you artificially limit the ability of somebody to maximize the value of their, uh, you know, maximize the, the use of their property, the density of housing on their property, purely to protect somebody else's property value? Like the value of my property is not the business of government in the sense of, of, uh, of, uh, passing laws aimed at trying to, trying to stabilize it or trying to, trying to, uh, inflate it or keep it at a certain level or keep it from rising to a certain level. Like, like 
like that should be you know, the value of my property should be up to the market to decide, right? But the government should not be using its power and authority to uh, to tell somebody else they can't build an apartment in in my neighborhood, for example, because well, you know, I mean, somebody might not want to buy my house. Hey, you know what? That's that's uh, that's just kind of the luck of the draw, buddy. If somebody decides they don't want to buy your house because they don't like your neighborhood, that doesn't mean you have a right to decide what your neighborhood looks like, right? But Beyond health it- and safety. Just but there are other so aspects to zoning. Something right? I'd, I'd want to turn back. Now, yeah, there are certainly other aspects of planning. And for example, if somebody says, you know, especially well, look, with density, uh, that's what I would yeah. think. Yeah. Well, like density. So I think density is, you know, uh, uh, you know, you may you may be able to make an argument that that uh, okay, well, you shouldn't be able to build a giant, you know, hundred uh, hundred story building in a single family uh, type neighborhood. But then again, who typically wants to do that? Typically, people just want to build a little more dense, you know, a little more dense to accommodate a few more people, and that's the kind of that's the kind of planning that that has such odious outcomes and and is so uh, prevalent in 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 big cities with high uh, uh, high you know, high rents and high um, uh, uh, high cost of living that makes it difficult to to own or, or even to rent. Um, now, certainly, some planning has some value. Uh, or some urban planning, you know, you want to you want to make it so that, for example, your industrial sector of town is not, uh, you know, not pumping pollutants into your residential sector of town and on and on and on like that. But mm. um, I suppose somebody who is skeptical of a lot of this urban planning, like I am, you know, not all urban planning, but at least some of it here, is is saying that a lot of these decisions are perhaps cloaked in the language of health and safety, but are really about property values, about, uh, about uh, protecting uh, uh, homeowners from change. And the end result of this is that we have problems now, like say, uh, you know, uh, affordable housing in a city like San Francisco to pick the absolute worst example of this, you know, where it's just very extremely difficult to live there, to rent, to, to be able to pay rent, to ever be able to afford a piece of property there. And, uh, you know, just a huge reason for that, if you take a look at what the city looks like from above, is that they have just suppressed building they've made it so hard to build they've attached as somebody who came onto our show a california environmental uh, law expert came on our show and told us that they uh they they force cities or they force new builders to do these onerous environmental reviews that go down to you know 500 to 1000 pages do any kind of modest development and they allow anybody to object to them for for just about any reason and the end result is that it makes it more expensive more difficult to to live in these cities and what does that make people do well it sure doesn't make them uh, uh get agitated about government it typically makes them get agitated about capitalism right housing is a human right why is it i don't have uh, access to affordable housing and unfortunately, the, the uh, sad truth is that typically it seems to be uh, government action, government restrictions are designed to protect incumbent, uh, you know, I guess, homeowners, incumbent yeah. interests at the expense of new ones. And so that's an example of regulation I'd like to ratchet down. Um, yeah, there are other examples of regulations I'd like to maybe ratchet up, you know, like universal health care, for example, is a program that most neoliberal that types you would, are yeah. interested in. You would because put a lot more money in. Yeah, because, well, I mean, that's the thing is it, you know, other countries uh, are peer countries in terms of being very developed and having advanced economies. They they almost all, I think, have some form of universal health care and they don't pay more for their systems than we do. We pay an inordinate amount for our system and we get, you know, we, we get uh, all these uh, awful financial outcomes and we get about the same in terms of health outcomes, not even as yeah, good I'm pretty as some sure of these Canada actually on average, I mean, we, we have pretty high taxes, but I know we have yeah. lower taxes, um, at least like for a middle and upper middle class um Mm -hmm. people uh compared to like california states like california Mm -hmm. or new york um and obviously we get a we get a lot more in return for that um i know yeah i know that how would um, you explain something like that well i don't know i won't be able to say like you know what people in california i guess get for their taxes but i feel like um yeah i live in florida not california but i will say sorry It seems like, um, no, I just mentioned California is kind of the most odious example of the housing thing that I know Mm -hmm. a little bit more about. But I guess what I would say is, well, I don't know much about Canada. I do know that the uh, the average British taxpayer, um, while they are paying more in taxes than the average American, when you add the cost of health care that Americans pay to the uh, cost of taxation that Americans pay, and then you compare that to what a British person's paying for taxation, which of course typically includes, mm. you know, most all the health care, then the American is actually worse off in that situation a lot of times. And that's, you know, that suggests that something's really wrong with the way our system works. And I would not say it's just greed or, or capitalism. I think it's kind of the result of the strange 
public-private hybrid system we've constructed in the United States that seems to be able to, to derive the benefits of neither a public system or a private system. Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of grew out of, uh, it grew out of, uh, you know, maybe an arguably bad government action during World War II, this kind of freeze on wages and prices and companies needed labor. And so one of the ways they competed for labor was through benefits like healthcare. And as a result, we built a system that very much enmeshed uh, this idea that employers provide your health insurance. And you know, that's where it started. And this is kind of the mutual, you know, disaster of a system we've got out of it. You know, so it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, we would like to, I think that would be an example of where maybe you might, I don't even know if this would mean more regulation on net, but just we would like to have, I suppose, what most people would perceive as more government, which would be universal health care. Um, in regards to the in, property yeah. thing? Um, yeah. In regards to the property thing, the Canada actually has a similar problem that California has. I don't know if other places in the states do too. Yeah. Where there's um, housing is basically unaffordable to people under like under fifty. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, just to own a shack, you have to be a millionaire. Like not even just upper uh, middle class or even upper class. Like you have to be like, very 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 wealthy. Um, and the things that have been blamed on that particularly have been like a lack of regulation with investing. Um, so baby boomers. And so there's a lot of resentment here. Um, for I mean, actually, I'm I'm guessing you look like you're under fifty. Um, and you own a, another property. And there's so there's been a lot of blame on people who buy second homes and so there's resentment that people can own one more than one home when the majority of people can't own any homes um and obviously the more people who are buying homes it raises the prices naturally in like a market um well, so how would you respond to that like if someone yeah. said like blamed you for you know being a landlord and raising market prices of homes yeah, I, uh, I so there are a couple of places where the market is so distorted and so messed up. Like again, in San Francisco, we talked to another mm -hmm. housing expert about this, where you can start to blame landlords because landlords now are benefiting so much from the restricted housing supply and have so much freedom to just raise rents as much as they like. But they are also in on the game of uh, of making housing unaffordable because they don't they don't need they don't need to expand, for example, buy new properties to make more money. You know, there's no there's so little slack in the housing market there. But generally speaking, I think the idea that landlords um, and uh, you know, I, I, we, have a, we have what is called an accessory dwelling unit. So we don't rent out a second property. We have built a, a property or we have built um, an additional structure on our home that we rent oh, okay. out. Um, and that so ba basically uses the same amount of land, but it increases the, the housing stock in that sense. So that we, we actually found out about this at a, at, a, at a seminar locally for how to make housing more affordable and found out, oh, you know, investment opportunity. And also we can increase the housing stock. Oh, without, that's actually you know, cool. So you, you found the else. ethical way to be a landlord. Well, I think they're all, I think they're all pretty much ethical, but you know, I don't have any issue with, with uh, owning something and renting out to somebody else, even if I may, you know, may conclude that that, that economic activity may be, you know, more or less beneficial than some other. I don't think it's like immoral to do, but the, the thing about this though is, um, this is another kind of activity, accessory dwelling units that was often mm -hmm. banned by local governments that, that many local governments have only just started to look at pulling back. And, um, you know, we, we actually had somebody do that in our community a few years ago. We had somebody make a strong case for, you know, these kinds of dwelling units. And so we can build them. But the, um, I guess what I would say to the, the person you mentioned, you know, in Canada about, you know, all these people buying housing as investments, right? The problem is the restriction on supply, because if there are people out there who are paying for the construction of new buildings, then there is no reason to imagine that having more supply will therefore mean uh, that, that, that prices will also go up. I mean, you know, you know, sure, there, there are uh, there are always a, a strange exemptions to the rule, but generally speaking, more supply should sate uh, should sate demand should should mean lower prices because people, you know, the seller has to compete for customers a little bit more when there's more supply out there. And while I would not pretend to be an expert on what's going on in Canada, we did actually take a look at this. I think yesterday, um, either yesterday or the day before on our stream, because I was curious about. Uh, about why or no this was actually on on our discord i was curious about like what what's going on in vancouver where apparently there are these people from china who will invest and buy houses yeah, in it's vancouver it's a problem here too like and the then, foreign investors yeah and then not even like they won't even rent them out you know they, hmm. they'll just leave them literally yeah, they're empty. they won't even apparently yeah they won't even rent them out you know not even renting for a high price they just won't rent them out and so 
Uh, there are two uh, uh, big uh, government uh, problems here, it seems. Uh, maybe three. So one, um, uh, uh, the biggest one is, of course, from China, where the Chinese government is a totalitarian uh, fascist dictatorship that will seize your assets uh, without trial or hearing or anything on a, on a whim. And as a result, a lot of people in China, understandably, want to get their money out of the country and translate it into a form that the communist or that the totalitarian government uh, cannot seize. And so they will buy property overseas, which, you know, Canada will defend property rights. And so, you know, they will not let the Chinese Communist Party seize mm -hmm. your house. At least, you know, I guess. Yeah, I, I so can't what imagine would be the neo -lib, so, What would be well, the neo-lib answer to that problem? Let me finish uh, kind of getting to the problem here. So that's one. Uh, the other problem. Uh, the other problem is that um, uh, they they don't rent. Uh, let's see. So uh, that's one cause. The other cause is the um, the uh, oh the uh, they have similar restrictions up in uh, in Vancouver that they have in some of these big American cities. We found out that make it very difficult to build even small increases in density. You know, duplexes, four story apartments, things like that. So that's one. Uh, that's two. That's another government problem. That's the Canadian government then, or the local government probably in Vancouver. I don't know. If, I don't think the Canadian federal government's involved in that. And then the third problem is I found out that apparently in Vancouver property taxes are mega low. Um, and while I can't speak to this as clearly as I can speak to the other issues, um, it really surprised me to find that my property tax bill here in Florida is substantially lower than apparently it would be in Vancouver for a house of the same value. So it seems like it is also very lucrative or it is, it is less harmful um, to somebody who wants to buy this property. Like they can go to Vancouver and they can buy this property and sit on it, right? And the amount of money that they lose every year in property taxes is less then, uh, you know, it would be maybe in a lot of parts of the United States, like in, you know, just over the yeah. border in Seattle. It, I haven't heard of this problem to the same degree. And it seems like in Seattle, the property taxes are two or three times more. So super low property taxes, um, uh, super uh, uh, high density restrictions. And of course, China, like taking money from these people. So what would I do about this? Well, there's nothing you can really do about the Communist Party of China being what it is. So the uh, next thing I would do is I would, one, ease those density restrictions, because to me, the first thing you should do is you should make it easier for people to build more. And then beyond that, uh, particularly in the near term, I could understand perhaps some kind of vacancy tax uh, for, for this literally unused uh, property that's just being used as kind of a, uh, a sitting, you know, just an asset sitting there empty. I mean, you know, uh, a tax to, I guess, try and incentivize some use of the property. Uh, but eventually, what I would like to do is to make it easier for people to build and to respond to market demand so that when a Chinese investor comes and says, for example, I want to put my money in your country so that the people in my country don't take it from me. And in exchange, I want a house that someday I can sell to get some of that money back or maybe make some money. You know, I mean, that's that's not really a problem in, in, in and of itself, as long as there are developers who can continue to build houses to respond to demand, you know? And the problem is that there's this demand, there's high demand, not just from investors, but from people who want to live in Vancouver, which is a beautiful, a great city to be in, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but they just don't have the, the freedom to do, uh, you know, to provide that supply. So in the short term, because there are people who need houses now and, and building takes time, some kind of uh, tax to incentivize, you know, them to at least rent this stuff out. But in the long term, there is no substitute for more, uh, for more supply, building more, and that's the most important thing to do. Well, are there any um, are there any regulations you would support? Because you mentioned before that you do support some. So, like, what about things like climate change, like carbon emissions? Yeah, like yeah, that's a good example. That's actually probably a better example in healthcare because there's really, you know, there's not, not, mm -hmm. you know, there's no. Uh, you know, Maybe in the uh, maybe in the long run, markets could. I think it's possible that the desire people have, you know, for cleaner energy and all that, in the long run, you know, might might allow for a market solution. But unfortunately, we don't really have the time for the long run. And so I think that um, you know, it's uh, it's good to first of all, I guess, at a base level, you have to have governments work together to establish binding targets for emissions reductions. And we got a little, uh, we're moving toward that direction, I guess, with like the Paris Accord, although I don't, I don't believe they're particularly binding, but governments have to work together. Uh, I know that China is somewhere between 20, 25% of global emissions. The United States is somewhere around 15%. Europeans, I imagine, are somewhat comparable to us. And if the three of us can't work something out, then that's, you know, uh, more than half the emissions on the planet, right? We've got to, got to work something out because any of us doing this stuff on our own will make no difference if uh, we're not doing it together. So that's, that's one thing. And then locally, um, you know, uh, you know, here at home, I would, I would want to incentivize the uh, construction of cleaner energy in the place of, of uh, dirty energy. You know, first of all, putting priority on getting rid of coal 
and eventually phasing out fossil fuels altogether. Um, you know, I think there will probably always be a role for my favorite form of energy, of course, which is natural gas, which I, I work at, but you know, certainly less of one with respect to, you know, uh, you know, maybe to where it is today. And then, uh, you know, more, more government sponsorship of things like nuclear power, uh, reducing the regulations that make it very hard to build nuclear power plants, but uh, also subsidizing uh, the construction of more nuclear power plants. That right? sounds so that's scary, the situation reducing we, we regulations develop. with nuclear power plants. I don't know. I watched yeah. Chernobyl recently, so yeah. I don't know if you saw that. So uh, oh, yeah. that, that sounds that. a little scary because to me, well, tell regulations why. with that sound like a very good idea. Absolutely, they do. And that's one reason why they are so tightly regulated. Mm -hmm. But um, let me, uh, I've got an article here that I found recently um, that a guy named Scott Lincecum shared that I hope I can find again because he uh, covered, uh, he talked about uh, how nuclear power is so tightly regulated that has made it effectively impossible for us to build new nuclear plants in the United States. Um, and let me see here. Um, uh, let me come um, and nuclear. I want to, I'm going to, I really want to find this because this is such an, oh, interesting, yeah, it's totally fine. Um, gosh, I don't know if I'm going to find it here, but uh, he's a prolific tweeter and uh, unfortunately so am I. So it's kind of, kind of um, locked up. I don't know. I'll, I'll keep scrolling through it here. But in essence, the problem is that as, uh, as, uh, first of all, it takes a very long time to get these, these planned and the startup costs are very high. And so that's a, that's a challenge, right? And then the other challenge is that, gosh, I don't this article. The other challenge is that the standards for uh, radiation reduction continually grow as the technology advances, right? So it's, um, there's a, uh, let's see, uh, let me sort of find the standard, Lamar nuclear. Um, okay, so they have a regulatory standard that says, that uh, it's called ALARA, which is as low as reasonably achievable. And the guiding principle of radiation safety is ALARA, as low as re reasonably achievable. Even if it's a small dose, if receiving that dose has no direct benefit, you should try to avoid it, right? And that sounds good, right? We hate radiation, it's bad, you know? I mean, you don't wanna, you don't wanna get a face full of that, it'll really ruin your day, you know? You mm -hmm. wanna get cancer and all that. But if you think about how this standard works in practice, what seems to be the case is that uh, even though we have achieved a situation where plants rarely, uh, rarely emit radiation, where plants rarely uh, fail in the ways that, you know, we can name off some of the big nuclear disasters like Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island, primarily because there have been so relatively few of them, you know, and Chernobyl- yeah, but when really it happens, it's really time. bad. Yes, when it happens, it's really bad. But it's important to remember that every day, all right, that that nuclear power plants, uh, you know, is operating. It, it is, uh, you know, that risk is there, right? But if if the plant never has a failure, never has a meltdown, then it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen, right? Like uh, Three Mile Island, for example, emitted some radiation, and this is the only nuclear disaster I can think of in the United States. It really, wasn't much of a disaster, as far as I know. Um, nobody, nobody died. Let me, let me look this up. Three Mile Island. Um, let me look this up so I can demonstrate it here. Okay, so um, the outcome uh, was um, health effects and epidemiology. Um, yeah, uh, no, uh, no additional cancer deaths. Uh, you know, really, like relatively, uh, relatively little, relatively little outcome here for this one. But um, health Fukushima, issues are not the you know, only thing. There's also environmental well, problems, right? Like the area of Chernobyl and a lot of like these yeah. nuclear disasters, like it permanently basically well, ruins the land. So Chernobyl has been, and that's the result of uh, a government that directed uh, uh, very tightly the, uh, the um, that's the government that controlled the entire industry, controlled everything and yeah. had no liability, right? So it, it could not face trouble for what it did because it can always suppress trouble. As a result, it chose yeah, to build true. nuclear power plants on the absolute cheap. It didn't have, uh, for example, the secondary uh, the secondary concrete container shell that even by that point in time had been common in nuclear plants in all the other countries in the world, right? So Chernobyl was, I think, a failure magnified by the failures of the Soviet system. But by comparison, our nuclear plants are very safe. And it's important to remember that, you know, while we can think about Chernobyl, every single day, those coal plants are putting particulate matter in the sky that is killing people, right? Mm -hmm. Who would otherwise no, not die. That. Every single day, they are driving climate change, right? Which would otherwise not happen as quickly. So the harms for those are a much slower burn, but they are also guaranteed. Like they are always happening. 
the harm, like the coal plant will always be causing some harm. Whereas the nuclear plant, you know, maybe you can make the same argument on, on the whole, but it's just much less. And of course, if you take climate change seriously, you have to recognize that even the, you know, even most disasters of nuclear disasters has relatively minimal effect on climate change. Well, that's Whereas, why I would uh, you support know, the, nuclear Every good power. day at the coal plant, you know, drives climate change. So. Well, that's why as a whole, I would support nuclear power. Um, yeah. The, um, but to me, like the, you know, one of the pros, it's such a good example um, to me of regulations, right? Because where you have something that has the potential for um, like something amazing and something that yeah. we need in society, we're like reducing fossil fuels and all that stuff. Um, but it also has a huge negative potential. So that's where regulations come into play to just, you know, yeah. increase the chances that, you know, you're going to lean in the good direction and not the bad direction. Yeah, I mean, it sounds good when you put it that way, but the fact is that we have not built a new nuclear plant since 1979. So the I think effect there are a couple of, of new should... plants. There are a couple of new plants that may come on, uh, I think, uh, sometime in the next few years. But for the most part, the United States uh, it, it has regulated itself out of the nuclear power business. And and my, my argument here is that while I wouldn't say that, therefore, we should make nuclear power dangerous, we should, for example, think about... Uh, and the article I wish I could find makes this uh, makes this argument more clearly than I do. But you know, we should think about perhaps uh, whether we have basically, through the course of these regulations on nuclear power, ensured that we as Americans will die sooner and drive more climate change than we otherwise would, as a result of the fact that we have done such a good job regulating nuclear power out of you know out of uh, out of uh, a new construction. You know? So what about? Um... I'm just I'm trying to name off the things like I'm not an expert sure. at all in economics. Um, no. Yeah, just putting that out there. But I'm thinking of like the primary defenses that I would put up like against the idea of, you know, of lesser regulations. So what about something like healthcare? Um, we touched a little on healthcare, but in Canada, one of the reasons why uh, our healthcare system is so affordable is because the government mm -hmm. regulates drug prices. Um, yeah. And I'm guessing you would be would you be against that? Um, you know, look, it, it seems like all the successful countries that have uh, affordable health care do some kind of regulation of drug prices, some kind mm -hmm. of reform of patents and things like that. So, I mean, you know, if you can if you can uh, demonstrate to me, for example, that that there's a, a better uh, way that has worked uh, better than, for example, something I might otherwise defend. And I'm open to that. I'm not you know, I'm not going to uh, uh, take ideology and hammer it against uh, against empirical reality every time. But no, you're not an ideologue. Uh, basically. Well, sometimes, yeah, I think I am. I just think I'm oh. more of a, more of a, you know, I, I, I suppose I'm not a, uh, you know, a, uh, a behead those who disagree with me ideologue, you know, I mean, I think I, I think I have, you know, I have values that I try and argue for. And those values are very important to me beyond uh, just utilitarian calculuses. Mm -hmm. But I am not, you know, I'm not going to say, well, it doesn't matter that this healthcare system is just much better because it, it, violate some fundamental principle of mine because at the end of the day people want affordable health care and will uh continue to uh continue to seek it out so the question is what is the best way to get it so uh you know canada seems to have a system that you know is is uh, pretty good in some ways certainly financially it's much better than uh, you know for the average canadian than our system is better financially for the average american um but it seems to me that the examples of uh you know the examples i would look at are, are probably the uh, systems in in uh, uh, the Netherlands, in Germany, in uh, I think in, mm. in Taiwan, that have more role for private actors than I think the Canadian one does, and which accordingly are probably a little more in line with what we could do in the United States and would probably want to do. I mean, I would not want to have, for example, a situation where the government says you can't compete with an existing provider at all, ever. Like we are the only provider. Like that is, that's a really high bar. You gotta, I think, have a really good rationale yeah. for that. Rather than, you know, like for example, I know there's some people who say, well, no, we can't do that. What if somebody wants to pay more and get higher quality care? That, you know, I don't care about that. I don't care about the fact that that's possibly unequal. What I care about is the good quality of the universal system, right? And if, if, uh, if uh, you know, if, but if we can guarantee that without saying, you know, uh, restraining somebody's freedom, then, you know, I'm, I will uh, generally choose freedom over equality if I can if I can do that. But that being said, um, I guess another point that I would want to make is uh, that uh, you know I am uh, I'm I am generally against things like price controls. I think generally they don't work, but uh, you know it's important to recognize that there are exceptions to a lot of these rules and. 
the challenge is to to find those exceptions and to demonstrate why they're exceptions rather than to just kind of um, reflexively fight against every exception or reflexively say, no, 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 controlling prices is always a good thing. Capitalism is always bad. It's always driven by greed. You know, like I think uh, I think the results of the 20th century have shown that that uh, capitalism, yeah, as the anarcho-capitalist in my chat just said, demonstrate why they are exceptions, right? That's a reasonable thing, I think, to do. And um, yeah, I think the 20th century has shown that capitalism generally achieves far better outcomes than the alternatives. And you have an anarcho-capitalist yeah. in, your, in your chat? Um, yeah, we have, we have some. Yeah. We have have some you ever played Rust by any chance? No, I haven't. Why, why do you ask? You should, you should play that. It's a anarcho-capitalism in... Um, yeah, in practice, and wow, um, especially with mostly thirteen-year-olds, and it's very scary. Wow. I, I would recommend uh. it. Very, it'll bring out the worst in everyone. Um, <laughs> but, I'm not uh, an anarcho-capitalist, so I should be clear. But yeah, yeah, I, I um, think so. I guess my my point there, just to tie it up, is that you know I will generally acknowledge that it's possible to have an exception to the rule, and that where there's an exception, like say one industry mm -hmm. that because of its unique circumstances seems to be. Uh, uh, something that you know shouldn't be handled through the market alone, like healthcare. Yeah, we can look at that. That just that doesn't. The existence of something like healthcare does not invalidate, you know, the general principle that that uh, markets are good, market solutions are good, and and we should let people make decisions for themselves. So, have your views evolved at all, or have you always kind of had this leaning towards neoliberalism? Um, you know, I guess I was more of a conservative when I was little. Uh, more, you know, in high school and all that. Um, and I was a little more interested in a little more uh, uh, lefty type stuff when I was in college. But I mm -hmm. think now I've sort of... Uh, I went through the yeah, same I'm, thing. Yeah, I think I've sort of, uh, I've sort of, uh, you know, uh, settled on where I think I, uh, I think, I don't know, what I think are the right answers, you know. What were like the primary things that, you know, um, moved you to this position? Oh, I suppose getting more involved with government through the course of my work and getting more involved in, I don't know, adult life as opposed to being kind of a child, uh, reading, you know, listening to conservative talk radio, you know, from, the, you know, yeah. from like my room as a kid, you know, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that, talk radio, I love it. yeah, you know, I mean, Rush Limbaugh is, you know, I guess very persuasive when you're, uh. You know, uh, I guess I was like 15, but yeah, it's not not so much, I guess, now that I'm, you know, 33. So it's, uh, you know, uh, well, and he, of course, just passed away. But yeah, I think that uh, I think that generally speaking, uh, I, I don't know, everybody probably evolves politically with time uh, mm -hmm. as they as they are exposed to different experiences in life as they, I guess, uh, gain more knowledge and and uh, talk to people about the things they believe in. But yeah, I think I've sort of settled here in a place I'll probably be staying for some time. I think in general, I often support a lot of regulation in Canada, but whenever I have to do anything that involves regulation, I like become a full neolib, right? Like in those moments, yeah. Um, yeah. I you know, anything that's minor, especially like when, when you're going against red tape, um, like just bureaucracy in Canada is like, very triggering and very frustrating and very inefficient. Yeah. Um, well, would you say that's one of like the primary reasons why you're a Neil Lope? Yeah, I mean, maybe that maybe that helps a little. I guess I'm just. I'm guessing I'm not you really... did do a lot of that as a lawyer as well. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Although to me, I think it's less the existence of red tape than exposure to how the red tape is made and the mm -hmm. motivation behind the red tape and the effects of the red tape. Like, you know, if somebody says, you know, look, you got to go through all these rules to do this, and those are good reason you know this is the best way to to handle something and you know i'm not gonna just say it's bad because uh you know bureaucracy is uh uh, uh is is bad uh, always just on its own you know, on, uh, you know it's always bad irrespective of the justification or irrespective of the rationale or the outcomes you know sometimes i guess there's not really a way around it you know the military is kind of a bureaucratic institution but there's probably no other way to handle uh, you yeah, know, it's the, like a necessary evil. You know, to handle uh, the people who have all the guns than to have a system that is very, you know, rules based and and uh, very, uh, you know, uh, you know, by the book. But, uh, you know, I think when I, gosh, I remember there's kind of a formative, I guess, experience that that really sort of sealed it when I, I sort of became very, um, I don't know, I lost a lot of uh, 
I, this was kind of an experience uh, early on as a young lawyer that sort of made me lose a lot of faith in, in uh, people on the left. Um, so I worked in a, I work in energy and um, mm -hmm. that's uh, a field that I you know, think is very interesting and challenging and all that. And I went to a meeting of what is called the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the federal body that you know, regulates pipes, uh, natural gas pipelines, and regulates uh, a lot of energy in the United States. So it has a big impact on the environment, on climate, on, on health, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's an important agency, right? They were doing a public hearing in New York. Anybody could show up to this hearing and speak their piece to the five member commission that uh, has a big role in regulating energy in the United States, right? It ain't like, you know, trying to get a meeting with a president. You just show up, you know, I mean, and, and you, you, you fill out a sign in sheet, you wait your turn and you can speak to the commissioners of this federal agency. And who shows up to this? Well, it's primarily people like me who are there for work. You know, it is not really a lot of people who are there from the public. And I understand it's very difficult for the public to show up to this kind of things. They're typically done during work hours, which is kind of a problem. You know, um, so I, I get that. But what really got me was seeing a group of protesters who were out there to protest, uh, who were out there to protest the organization generally. And they were saying, ah, yes, you see, this organization, this Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is so bad. They won't listen to us. They are not interested in the environment. They work for big oil. You know, they're bad, bad news bears. Mm -hmm. And so I went out and I talked to them, you know, as somebody who's, you know, in the pocket of big oil and all that. And I said, look, look, you know, I mean, all you got to do if you want to tell them yourself is just, you know, you just show up, you know, you, you got to take off the mask you're wearing. They probably don't want you to wear a mask in the building. You know, it's very, very, uh, very, uh, you know, interesting group of people. You got to take off your mask, but you can show up, go to the hearing, you know, tell them yourself very directly uh, what the problem is, why you feel the way you do. And uh, they were, they were even responding to the questions people were asking. Um, and... They just looked at me like, what? Why, why would I do that? I'm out here to raise awareness. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to these bureaucrats. I don't, you know, I don't care about that. And I said, well, you know, there's another hearing tomorrow, actually, where, uh, you know, it's going to be, you know, there, it's, it's a, it's another hearing where you'll, you won't even, have, you can prepare in advance. You know, you can go to this hearing and you can uh, talk to the commissioners again in person and you'll be able to really just like express your express your point of view with the people who, who are in a position to do something about it. And also, by the way, uh, they often take uh, comments from the public into consideration. They'll even write them out in the regulatory decisions. You know, they'll say we heard from X and Y and Z. And they just said, no, nah, you know, we don't do that. There's value in being out here and kind of shouting. And uh, I just it's just like, mm. what, the, what do you what do you? What are you doing? Like, what is the point of this? I mean, so it's not to invalidate protests, of course, which certainly, you know, are especially valuable when there's no way to talk to somebody or when somebody's just not listening. But it just, I don't know, it, being an energy, there were just a lot of experiences like that where, you know, just people out there kind of being activists for that stuff applies everywhere though like the um especially on i like you know i i live near a university campus and um and i'm in university and there's there's just like this problem in general especially like i study israeli palestinian history um and i will see during israeli apartheid week um it's like a thing like once a week that happens yeah. and everyone will be protesting like on on both sides right like pro-israel yeah. anti-israel all this stuff um and I and I will never see one of those people in any of my classes. And I'm like, we're in a university. Like, you're not even learning about the history you're protesting. Um, yeah. Yet you're going out there, and it's just like it's very frustrating. Um, yeah. Because I yeah. feel like a part of activism should be education, right? Um, and yeah. should be doing something more practical, like with it as well. Besides, just I don't know. It seems like a little more fashionable, and that's frustrating. Yeah. I don't know, like, who's in a position to do something about whatever issue you care about, you know? I mean, is it, for example, back to housing, because I know that foreign policy is one. Foreign policy is one where I guess, you know, it's it's probably hard to get a meeting with the Secretary of State, you know? I mean, it's yeah. hard to, to, you know, I, I don't know really what the, the best way to get involved with that is. But, you know, if you're interested in affordable housing, I don't know, man, you gotta, you gotta show up to your local city yeah, there's council stuff you can do. And, you know, where they make these rules, where the five, you know, potentially uneducated, uninterested rubes who who rule over you at the local level, 
you know, where, where these people who I shouldn't, I'm just being a little facetious there, but you know, where the people who have been elected by your community to represent you, these people have the power to do something about your issue. And oftentimes the only people who talk to them are people like me who have a financial interest in whatever the outcome is, right? Mm -hmm. Well, ordinary people have a financial interest in affordable housing too, right? So, you know, you gotta show up and, and, and advocate for this stuff. I know it's not easy sometimes because a lot of cities will do their meetings again in the middle of the workday, you know, but uh, that's not always true. And a lot of cities will do better, you know, do better than that here in Florida, at least. Um, and I don't know, man, you just, you gotta, uh, you gotta, um, I don't know, if you want to do something about the world, I guess you have to get sort of constructively involved. And it feels like a lot of people are just kind of not interested in that. So you mentioned the military earlier. Yeah. Uh, would you say, would you call yourself an interventionist? I know that's a, kind of like a dirty word. But... No, I, I would. Yeah, I mean, okay. it, it, the United States should intervene uh, abroad with military force or with intelligence assets when the facts on the ground and the interests of the United States and the values involved in the situation are mm. such to justify it. So I wouldn't say every time, but I would also not say never. And I would defend certain past interventions on their merits, and I would attack certain past interventions on their merits. Mm. But, you know, I wouldn't say categorically that I'm against the United States being involved in the world, um, or categorically that I'm in favor of the United States uh, uh, invading, you know, invading, uh, you know, you know, every, well, uh, every dictatorship or, or not. Yeah. So there's like said um, country in like Northern Africa or something. Um, yeah. And it just used uh, chemical weapons on some yeah. of its like, uh, um, you know, on some of its the people participating in a revolt. Um, yeah. And then it's found out that they've been doing this regularly and they're like storing and building up their chemical weapons. Yeah. Um, do you would you agree with an intervention in that case? So this sounds like a country that's very much like Iraq, except it's in North Africa, right? Mm -hmm. And I would be, you know, I would at least think about it. I mean, for example, uh, we we would probably like to establish an international norm that you cannot just gas people to death uh, without yeah. some, that, without there being some kind of consequence. Um, it would also uh, be a good thing to enforce kind of an international norm about weapons of mass destruction that they're uh, that they are uh, generally controlled, and that countries that do not already have them will not get them. But, uh, you know, my answer to that today might be different than it would have been, say, in the past. Uh, while I certainly think the humanitarian justification is as strong as it ever was, um, you know, uh, you have to think about what would this intervention look like? You know, are we going to, is there an exit strategy? Are we going to be in this country for a very long time? Because the United States does well, I think, with very short and focused wars, uh, and it does very poorly with very long drawn mm -hmm. out wars that people lose interest in because then the forever war crowd comes in and says, Oh, we have to end this, you know, irrespective of, of the cost of doing so. It has been, you know, the, it, it's been unjust. It's been wrong and all that. We just saw that with Afghanistan, right? A, a war that the United States is certainly able to continue waging on probably forever based on the relatively minor commitment of troops and money that yeah. it costs for the United States to stay in Iraq. But the optics you know, are good. But the op people, yeah, people don't like the optics, right? They are, in fact, so uh, frustrated by the optics that they would rather effectively give the country to the Taliban, which seems to be the likeliest outcome of America leaving. They would rather give the country over to the Taliban than continue to maintain this unsatisfying military presence forever. So if we don't want a situation like that, uh, I suppose we have to think about what it is we're willing to do. And are we doing it alone? Are we doing it with others? Um, you know, uh, if it's just the United States on its own, um, you know, I would think about, for example, had we drawn, you know, are we willing to make a, uh, because if, if a country is still gassing people, for example, I might be willing to do it alone, the United States by itself. Um, uh, but we'd have to think also, is the United States willing to commit to this as a new red line policy uh, that anywhere in the world where this happens, the United States will at least give very serious thought to intervening. And in fact, no, we should just say, no, we're going to intervene. You use chemical weapons against your own people. We are going to attack you. We're going to bomb you and neutralize your capacity. So you can't do that. We're going to draw mm. a line and sand and say, that's our new rule that we are going to establish starting now. Okay. You know, that's something, but you know, we, what we shouldn't do, I suppose is what we did with Syria, where we said, well, uh, you know, if you use chemical weapons, that's a red line. And then uh, we just did nothing when it was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, concluded that, that chemical weapons were not used. So I guess uh, my answer would always have to be 
it would depend on the facts on the ground, but I would certainly be open to it, uh, particularly because you described the use of chemical weapons against civilian populations, I think. Yeah, you know, to me, the Rwanda, big deal is... It's like is... the example of where we didn't get involved in Rwanda mm. in 1994, where we just let a, a genocide happen and did nothing. And, you know, you can't always do something, right? The U.S. can't just uh, invade Xinjiang and China and stop a genocide, but it can... You know, it can sometimes use military force to stop a genocide. And when it when it can, it really should give uh, consideration to doing so. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Um, so what about a situation with, say, like what's going on with the Uyghurs? A lot of people are talking about that right now. Um, yeah. So whether or not people believe it's a genocide or not, there's definitely enough evidence that there might be a genocide going on. Right. Um, or there's like a heavy chance. And China certainly being deceptive. Um, yeah. But what happen What do you do in that situation where... Um, you know, intervening would probably lead to some kind of world war, right? Like at least in a military sense. Um, okay. So what's the solution to that? Well, um, I would uh, certainly not pretend to have all the solutions to that, but at least I would, yeah. I would think about some things. First of all, we're going to have to, uh, a country like China, the military approach is, is different than it would be, say, intervening in this hypothetical country you've described. Mm -hmm. We would for example, I think uh, I think we should very actively continue to um, perhaps more clearly than we do now guarantee Taiwan's uh, independence from China, even if not its independence as a sovereign nation. We should at least guarantee mm -hmm. that the status quo uh, with respect to Taiwan uh, will not be changed by force. Uh, and if somebody tries to change it by force, rather than through the, I guess, democratic uh, decision of the Taiwanese people, somebody tries to change it by force, we will uh, intervene to stop that. So I think that is uh, a point we should make where we wouldn't be willing to use military force against China because Taiwan is a democracy. And I think the United States should be very clear that uh, we will not permit autocrats to attack democracies uh, without facing uh, American military response. I think we should be very clear that we are not willing to let, you know, kind of the tragedies of the 1930s where we just let the Nazis kind of gobble one country up after the next. And then when the war came, they were stronger than they otherwise would have been anyway. And the war certainly is always going to come mm. one way or another once you let, you know, once you uh, start appeasing autocrats. I think that, you know, the 20th century kind of time and time again made that clear. So, um, you know, that's one situation where I would be willing to use military force. You know, American uh, isolationism China. is not... It's not a no. good history. That's why, like, no. when I I met very few American historians that are like isolationists, but it yeah. seems to be very popular right now on the left yes. and the right. Yeah, and you know, for for different reasons, the lefties really hate America, and the righties really hate what America stands for. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. far right and far left. You know, they really hate this idea that we would, for example, why would we why would we sacrifice American lives to defend an abstract value? You know, why would we get involved and help these other people out? Why don't they help themselves? But of course. You know, if you if you look at God, I had a debate. It was not exactly a debate. I kind of just yelled at this guy for uh, about ten minutes about this issue on one of um, God Prime Kai's, I think, his, one of his panels, uh, where mm -hmm. he was saying that that uh, other countries do not carry their weight. America just supports them and and defends them in exchange for nothing. And he was talking about I think Europeans in particular. And I'm just saying, look, man, you don't understand. For the first half of the 20th century. And this was, uh, this was a guy named Redneck. This was a guy on the right. For the first half of the 20th century, we got dragged into two world wars in large part because of one country, Germany, and its aggressions in Europe, you know? And and the, uh, the uh, European politics that underlined all that, right? And after World War II, uh, and of course, Japan, right? And after World War II, we turn these countries into allies. And now, to the extent we subsidize their defense somewhat, in exchange for that, we get not just allies who are strong in their own right, who, who contribute to us economically through, through trade and commerce and all that in their own right, but we have also ensured that they are not enemies. These big, powerful countries are our friends and allies, not our enemies, and the cost of maintaining that status quo is pennies on the dollar compared to the cost of, say, the two world wars that we had to fight to repeatedly subdue Germany and the, you know, the one world war we had to fight against Japan. So they just, I think... The cost there alone, even outside of the abstract values I've talked about, where uh, it's a good thing that we defend democracy, it's a good thing we're free, you know, free people stand together to defend freedom and all that. Even apart from that, just as a cost matter, it is so much cheaper to to be uh, allied to these countries than it would be to fight them in a war. And as the 20th century showed, uh, one way or another, people are going to drag us into wars uh, if we, uh, you know, if we just try and run from the rest of the world. It's just 
we're too big a country to be isolated. We can never be uh, Switzerland. We can never be, mm. uh, you know, we can never be uh, Uruguay or, you know, uh, well, I don't know well, about Uruguay's history, but what would you we can never be this new, neutral country. We're just too big. Well, what would you say to someone that says that, like, you're not being naive? Um, talking yeah. about, you know, that this is, you know, intervening is about, you know, American values um, or some kind of form of ethics. Like it's actually just about money and it's a subtle yeah, form of imperialism. Right. Um, yeah. Like, for example, the, the United States got involved um, or just I mean, just their own defense. Right. Like the United States got involved in World War Two, not because of, you know, what was going on with the Jews, but because, yeah. um, though I'm very grateful as a Jewish person that they did get involved. Um, but it was because of Pearl Harbor and obviously the fears of Japanese imperialism. Um, so, yeah, so what would be your answer to that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would never say that our, our interventions are not chiefly self-interested, as indeed I would mm -hmm. hope that as an American, uh, you know, who pays taxes to fund this gargantuan military budget could, that could otherwise certainly be spent on useful and productive, uh, you know, the military is not a productive institution. It is an extractive institution that costs yeah. money and spends it on salaries and bombs, right? And that's fine, you know. I mean, we need we need uh, the military, but it's important to remember that it's, uh, you know, of course there are other things we'd rather spend money on. Of course, we'd want to live in a world where there's no need to have a military, no need to uh, to be involved and, and actively engaged in the world. But, um, you know, uh, I think certainly these are all first and foremost self interested. I think I just made a very self interested argument for America actively uh, protecting uh, and, and being allied mm. to countries like, say, Germany and Japan today. So that's another thing. I could certainly make a self-interested argument for why we in the United States want to have a world in which regimes that gas their own people uh, do not exist, right? Because regimes that are willing to engage in those sorts of human rights disasters uh, do not typically seem to stop in their own borders. And the more that kind of stuff happens, the more normalized it is, you know, all, all of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, uh, yeah, it doesn't anyway, really need to be about um, morality. Yeah. So even, even if you want to take all the morality out of it, I can make self-interested, you know, and I think that, that self-interest is chiefly behind all our, our, uh, interventions overseas. So that's, that's an important thing. Uh, defending democracy abroad, I think defends democracy at home. This country's, uh, most, uh, isolationist reactionary folks are very much, uh, very much, uh, also, uh, into autocracy at home, whether it's America first today or America first in the 1930s and 19, early 1940s. That's another thing. Um, but beyond all that, I, I don't know that about the naivety angle, uh, naivete angle, like uh, fight, like maybe they think these wars are like for money and resources. Obviously, defense contractors sell weapons for profit. And mm -hmm. I don't think there's a problem with that. We want them to have an incentive to develop, I guess. You know, good weapons and to you know, develop them efficiently and all that. I mean, if we're going to have a military, we certainly don't want the military to be stuck in fair fights. We want our military to absolutely dominate and our defense contractors seem to be pretty good at providing good weapons. So I don't have an issue with the profit incentive as it relates to military uh, contractors, for example. I don't really have an issue with the, I, I, I often dispute the idea that we are waging wars for resources. Uh, re resources available in Afghanistan, pretty thin. The oil in Iraq uh, chiefly went to East Asia, and I, that was never, I don't think, any real serious uh, critics or proponents of the Iraq yeah, war. Yeah, I've had doubts I think, about the oil thing, too, with Iraq. You know, you can, there are a lot of uh, serious and legitimate reasons to criticize the war in Iraq, but oil is just not one of them as far as I can see. I mean, that may have been a, a low-level uh, calculus, you know, but it, that was, uh, I think, uh, you know, again, mostly oil ended up going to China. So if that was how, if that was a war for oil, it was pretty miserable. Um, um, a you few know, months it, but ago, I think it's generally not about, about, uh, about that kind of thing. A few months ago, when the Capitol building was, uh, you know, being raided on January 6th, um, you were very agitated on stream, right? Yeah. Um, do you feel that's like, do you feel that since then justice has kind of been served to those, you know, who raided the Capitol? Somewhat. I mean, a lot of them were arrested. Uh, some of them were sent to prison. Uh, I would like for everybody who raided the Capitol to have been jailed and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law without any kind of mercy given in their circumstances or anything like that. These mm -hmm. people actively attacked the whole country. Uh, and I think it's, you know, they, they actively tried to disrupt the counting of electoral votes for the presidential election of the United States. If they had succeeded in, for example, seizing the official uh, tally, you know, I mean, you know, if they had succeeded in killing Nancy Pelosi or killing Mike Pence, as they would have done if they had been able to do so, you know, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have stopped there. 
uh, as, as they did not stop when it came to clawing and beating police officers in the Capitol building, certainly would not have stopped. They managed to get their hands on Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi and indeed other people in Congress. They were minutes away in some cases from being able to get their yeah. hands on these people. So these were terrorists. Everybody who engaged in the attack on the Capitol is a terrorist and should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of existing law. That said, I think it is important to recognize that uh, we have uh, existing law that is capable of prosecuting and punishing all of these people um, and that we don't need new laws to do that. We don't need a new kind. We don't need to use this as a new example to build a new kind of enhanced national security state. Certainly uh, our existing uh, our existing law enforcement uh, should should pay attention to the folks who who did this stuff and, and the uh, you know, think about why they did it and whether maybe there are ways we can kind of uh, uh, be more proactive on issues like this. But, you know, there were some people calling for uh, sort of a second Patriot Act in response. Mm -hmm. And we certainly don't need that. We certainly don't need to sacrifice our our freedoms uh, you know, any further than we already have for the sake of our security. But at the same time, the extent these people broke existing law, as far as I know, everybody who uh, attacked the Capitol building broke existing law. I wish they had all been jailed as long as possible after being convicted of uh, their crimes. It's interesting to me that you use the word terrorist, right? Because while yeah. I totally think what they did was super wrong, I wouldn't have thought to use the term terrorist associated Next. with it. Um, because I guess I would define terrorism um, as, you know, purposely uh, pur purposely targeting civilians um, uh, for a political, to further a political purpose um, yeah. and to create terror, right? Yeah. So do you... Um, whereas in this situation, they were targeting like a mil um, they were targeting a political building, which I guess yeah. like it's the debate whether or not it's civilian. I wouldn't necessarily call that civilian. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, I so how would you define it? I don't think you, you can call it anything but civilian. I mean, these are the civilians who are democratically elected to govern the United States of America. They are absolutely civilians. And these are people who were uh, subjected to unlawful force for the purpose of intimidating or coercing our civilian government to uh, to further a political objective, which was for them the maintenance of uh, Donald Trump as president of the United States. And while these people may not have thought very hard about what they were doing, and indeed as a deranged, violent, unhinged mob, I have no doubt that they were not thinking very hard about what they were doing, about the consequences of what they were doing. Indeed, if you've ever wanted to see white privilege on display, and that's usually not something I like to really go off about, but God, it, just imagine having the having the nerve to attack the capital of the United States. These people uh, are really the height of just kind of privilege uh, in, you know, in action, just thinking that you can get away with doing something like this, that you have some right to do this. But no, these people used unlawful violence and by the way, trespassing, destruction of property, attacks on police officers, certainly all forms of unlawful violence. All of that was for the purpose of coercing civilians in government to further a political objective, uh, keeping Donald Trump in office uh, despite him having lost an election. So fuck these people. I wish every one of them could be prosecuted to the fullest extent of all law in the United States because every one of them tried to do their part, wittingly or perhaps otherwise, to uh, undermine democracy in the United States. And frankly, anybody who attacks democracy in the United States is basically an enemy of, of all mankind because if the United States goes down, and you know maybe they never had any serious chance of this, but they had some chance. If the United but, States goes down, the world is the world is in real trouble. I mean, certainly you as a Canadian are in trouble if the United States ever becomes sort of an autocratic regime. I mean, Canada is toast in that situation, and the rest of the world is is in, in for a lot of trouble too. So really, these people, every one of them, would don't worry, we have the French. The that day, they're they they're they're all just the worst and should have been uh, you know punished uh, uh, to the fullest extent of the law after being of course convicted. Of their crime. I got to push back against your definition of terrorism there, though, because I feel like that definition would mean that um, any revolutionary and, you know, and I do consider what they did yeah. somewhat like revolutionary, even though it was very, very failed, pathetic attempt. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and obviously, I don't think it's deserving. The United States is not deserving of a revolution, but um, I, you would you could I call would, like. Um, yeah. You could call basically would, like any revolutionary, like a terrorist by that definition. The United States yeah. was founded on yeah. a revolution, right? Against yeah. our great yeah. George III. And George Washington was a terrorist. And if really? George Washington, yeah, absolutely. The difference is, uh, could you have justified his terrorism in some sense? He certainly engaged in the unlawful use of force to uh, coerce a civilian population, uh, the, the British government of the time. 
but does that, you know, so then uh, I guess then if we're going to, if we're going to be consistent with our definitions here, if we're going to be consistent as to uh, who is engaged in terrorism, is there some justifiable purpose behind that terrorism? Well, let's compare the two terrorists, George Washington, uh, first of all, slave owner, right? So, uh, you know, certainly not a, a paragon of moral virtue, but nevertheless, let's think about what Washington was doing when he engaged in his terrorist insurrection against the uh, government of his time. The government of his time, the British Empire, refused after repeated peaceful entreaties uh, by the colonists and their elected representatives he, he, uh, they, they refused to extend any kind of civilian representation to the people of the colonies and indeed continue to tax them despite, uh, despite, uh, uh, them having no representation. Meanwhile, the folks who attacked the Capitol engaged in terrorism, not in, uh, furtherance of democracy, but in opposition to democracy. They tried to overturn a free election that they had every chance to participate in freely. They tried to overturn an election. So that's to me, the fundamental difference. They're both terrorism. But uh, the terrorists in the, who attacked the Capitol were bad because they were trying to destroy freedom. And the terrorists who attacked, uh, you know, the British Empire were good in the situation we've described, the American Revolution, because they were trying to enhance I don't know, freedom. Let's not and take I will it say one far. more thing. Poor George I'll say III. one more thing. No, George III was a was an autocrat, and he deserved uh, he deserved what happened to him, and worse because he he could have taken he, he could have used his role as the uh, monarch of the British Empire to uh, be consistent, you know, to expand parliament, to allow the, the colonies a, uh, a say in the empire. And instead he just, he refused to do that. And I will say one other thing about terrorists and revolutionaries. I think the real objection people have to the uses of these terms is that we think revolutionaries are good and terrorists are bad. And I think the fact is that sometimes terrorists are good and sometimes terrorists are bad. And we in the United States uh, chiefly imagine ourselves to be the good guys. And I think we oftentimes are. And our enemies are the terrorists and they are often bad. And I think that typically is the case. But nevertheless, uh, I think uh, Fast it. We, we have to do our conditions. We have to organize yeah. a debate um, on Georgia Third. I am so I'm down to take you on. I, we can't do it in this interview. But, but yeah, okay. like um, I, I would love to debate you on that. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I would, uh, I would, I would enjoy that. That would be, uh, that would be, uh, that would be something else. And by the way, I really appreciate the fact that you're, you're, uh, you're, um, um, My oh, avatar. Uh, sorry. Uh, Jack Walster says the Uyghur genocide isn't real. So Jack Walster is gone from the chat forever. Oh, um, yeah, I liked your avatar, how that went, um, really, uh, really spicy. Yeah, don't insult out. George III. I, this is why I hate Hamilton. I was watching that and I was like, this is some propaganda. I don't like it. Yeah, yeah that's true. It's, uh, it probably is. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh. It's uh, important, I think, to recognize that, you know, propaganda comes in many forms. I think we in the U.S. imagine that we don't have a lot of propaganda sometimes because we don't really have a state media in the way that other, other countries do. But we certainly have propaganda of our own. It's just we, we create a lot of it for ourselves. You know, it's, uh, what's so shitty is George III before, uh, he was actually a pretty nice guy, like before he uh, yeah. went a little, a little nutso. Yeah, um, it's kind uh, of, um... but his son was really evil. Like if there was someone who deserved to get revolted against, it was, his, it was his son. Um, the regent? Uh, yeah, um, George IV. It's kind of interesting that, um, the American Revolution, um, is, uh, is, uh, kind of interesting because it was, uh, Gosh, there's this great, uh, this great passage in the book that I uh, talked earlier. This was the one I was saying was my favorite one, uh, Europe, a History by Norman Davies. Mm -hmm. And I really want to look up this passage about the, uh, this will be one to kind of defend uh, King George and, um, and the British. So I want to, you know, I want to, I want to find I love that you're bringing you, out the right? sources. That's cool. Yeah. I want to, I want to find this for you, Eris, because you know, you've been, this has been, I've really enjoyed this interview and I don't want to, <laughs> I, wanna, I certainly don't want to. I want to be uh, on a on a bad note here, trashing your just your your favorite guy there, uh, you know. Um, okay, uh, so <clears throat> um, that, let's see. So this is kind of praising uh, and uh, calling the um, calling the uh, American Revolution into question. So the Constitution was written in the name of We the People of the United States and has proved remarkably durable. Uh, the, uh, it, but its irony lies in the fact that many of its leading pioneers and authors, including Jefferson, Madison, and Washington were slave owners, and that it was wrested from, that is say, W-R-E-S, it was wrested, taken from, one of the freest and best governed countries of the day. Because indeed, if I was living back then, certainly the best country I can imagine living in, other than of course the United States, would have been Britain, because it was certainly mm. the best governed country of the day, certainly the freest country, at least that I can think of, with my knowledge of history of the time, right? Um, and yet, you know, for, for whatever reason, this country just refused to extend the same representation to its citizens in North America that it extended to its citizens in the British Isles. Yeah, there's actually like a lot of stuff that 
um, kind of drives me nuts. Like with obviously, I do think there are some good reasons to to revolt, and we can get into that when we organize our our debate. But um, yeah, but there are also a lot of problematic reasons. Like a lot of people don't realize that the British Empire made um, a bunch of uh, like George III had actually made like a bunch of deals with the indigenous peoples of the Americas, um, yeah. and the colonists didn't like those. Um, so like they're you know so there's a lot of like dirty stuff like intermingled you That's know with true. that. Yeah, um, I will say that also in defense of George III, um, George III, uh, at least in the short term, I think probably uh, would have protected the Native Americans uh, oh, yeah. more than the United States government. He actually However, cared about them. However, the thing I would say about that is, one, I am somewhat skeptical of the he actually cared argument, but in either event, I think they would have certainly had a better outcome. Mm. However, that is, I think, in part because the United States under George III had no, you know, it was there was no democracy. So the wishes of the local population of, you know, British colonists mm. had no way of expressing themselves. And of course, they didn't want any kind of arbitrary restrictions on their on their, uh, you know, ability to expand and develop. That may be an argument against, uh, I, I suppose, democracy itself, which is kind of an interesting angle to take. But certainly, uh, I think the only reason it would have been more humane to the to the native people is that it also would not have represented the. Uh, you know, represented its own people. What's really cool about the George III thing is he was a prolific diary writer. He wrote yeah. like lots of, he wrote a diary entry every single day. And you can just like Google right now and you can read his diaries. Um, like he went through like this depression um, when, mm -hmm. you know, America revolted against him. Um, oh. He was genuinely really sad guy. He felt like very mm -hmm. rejected. Um, oh. And yeah, and, and it, like, I, this is why I love primary sources when you can go and just like read into these, um, like these leaders, whether they're bad people or good people or in between, um, just to see from their perspective what was going on. Um, so I would encourage you to read some of that. The, um, this is kind of an interesting subject because they, uh, the, uh, there were a lot of people at the time, I guess, who were who were saying that, you know, if we give the colonists representation, eventually they will overshadow us and they will, you know, they will be so peopled that we will be a, you know, we'll be kind of a, uh, you know, because it's a big continent versus an mm. island, right? You know, there will be so many more people there, you know, they're growing very quickly, but eventually we will be just kind of second class citizens on our own island. That's kind of one fear. Um, there was another fear that, uh, that, um, uh, gosh, what was it? Um, what was the other thing? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, just just a lot of little stuff like that. But I guess one of the things that is sort of disappointing about it all is that uh, it, it seems like uh, King George was, you know, an all right guy in his personal life. It doesn't seem like he, like in in practice, I think the way he responded to the revolutionaries, um, you know, or terrorists, you know, depending on your point of view. <laughs> um, I think they certainly qualify as uh, terrorists though once they take up arms. I mean, they're certainly breaking the laws of the country that existed at the time. But um, you know, uh, the way he responded to the founders of the, of the United States was to just kind of not respond or to, to talk about, you know, hanging them all. It's kind of unfortunate because I imagine, I think that, you know, when you look at what they wanted, independence was not their, not the goal of most of them. Um, certainly at first, I think only, only once the British army gets more directly involved in North America. And then particularly once it starts firing on, on some of the colonists, did people really start talking about an in independence? Because prior to that, they were all about the quote rights of Englishmen. You know, I think they certainly viewed themselves as being very much as British as the the, the British themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of it's kind of sad in a way that that's you know a, a lot of bloodshed that probably was unnecessary if if uh, they had all just been able to to get democratic representation. But that being said, I think that that the United States has been a, a good a good thing in its own sake. Um, or its well, own they way. definitely I, made I, something of themselves, you know, yeah. and become a yeah. a world superpower. Um, what Have you was... ever seen? I, sorry, oh, sure. can I ask you one? There's yeah. a movie called The Madness of King George that paints him in a very yeah. sympathetic light too. Have you ever seen that? I haven't seen that one. I've heard about it. Yeah, it's a it's a good one. It kind of goes through sort of the late stage with his um, sons, who you were talking about, who are very mm -hmm. very bad and just kind of grasping for power and and. Um, I think it paints him in a very favorable, kind of very humane light while also... He was a part of the Hanover dynasty, which yeah. um, was notorious. I don't know if there's genetics or culture associated with this, but they always yeah. had father to son problems. Like huge fathers, like his, he yeah. had... George III actually had huge problems with his father. Um, mm -hmm. His father actually didn't even speak English and um, was German and all this stuff. And so he was very determined to be like a really like a philosopher king um, oh. and all this stuff. And uh, yeah, and I think he he felt like he really failed, and it's like it's very tragic and sad because um, yeah. his intentions were kind of good. 
Um, yeah, and his his sons kind of sucked. <laughs> so. Mm. Womp, womp, womp. Yeah, he uh, he suffered from some uh, some kind of disease later on. But he sort of I, I don't know that many people remember him in Britain now for the uh, the American Revolution because of course he had the win. He had also presided over the victory over Napoleon. So he certainly mm-hmm. got. Yeah, he certainly. I think he's known for being mad. I think that that's yeah. kind of like the sad, the sad womp, thing. Womp. Um, womp, yeah, very womp. tragic story. Um, but anyways, uh, I wanted to get into the Derek Chauvin trial. I know you said that. Um, uh, you know, the type of law that you practice is yeah. um, uh, incorporate stuff, but, yeah. you know, but obviously you're probably going to know more than like, you know, an average layman um, when it comes to law and stuff. Were you actively watching the trial? No, I, I was not. And I actually uh, was just thinking he's probably um, the, the, uh, the police typically are not convicted in these Mm-hmm. types of cases and so i was just thinking why do i want to watch this when there's really you know it's probably uh, so no were chance. you surprised but, by the yeah outcome? i was i was uh, yeah i was surprised and um it was uh yeah i mean in retrospect a lot of people have said it's kind of a you know this if there was ever a case where the officer was going to get convicted this is the one i mean everybody saw the video and mm-hmm. and uh it was a real a real tough case prove otherwise it's just that typically uh people seem to seem fine for the police officer even in cases that people think are very one-sided but nevertheless uh, I, I'm glad it happened. I'm glad that he was convicted because not only do I think it was the right decision, but I think it's a step toward uh, having a little bit more accountability for police. And uh, it's, it's a small step, really, but it's a step in the sense of police not uh, having such an easy time maybe in court anymore um, because, you know, it's, it is very, uh, very, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, I think it is possible to. Uh, it's more possible to imagine than it was uh, the police uh, being convicted for, you know, uh, convicted of engaging in these kinds of crimes. And for what it's worth, uh, I don't know if you've interviewed Pisco on uh, 95 yet. I don't know if you know no, or, I or familiar with his to. work. He's a cool guy and he watched the trial. I think he watched mm-hmm. it on stream. So you could certainly, um, he's a law student, um, which means he probably knows more about, you know, about law than, than I do because he's very familiar with it, you know, yeah, and, like and studying it. and. You know, I'm, 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 you know, I know my niche thing, you know, because that's what I make money on. But he, um, he, uh, yeah, he'd be somebody who good, who'd be good to talk to about it. Um, I can kind of talk about it, I guess, at a high level, though. I'm just glad that the decision went down as it did. I think it'll be a good step toward criminal justice reform. Uh, you know, it's just a step. It's not, you know, it's not like, I think it's very hard to say that justice was done because yeah. the man is still dead. But to the extent that justice can be done in situations like these, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a, a good, a good thing. And, um, I don't know. I, I, I think it's more than nothing. A lot of people are trying to write it off like it's nothing, but it's also not, you know, it's not proof that, uh, everything's, you know, hunky dory either. Some conservatives have criticized the trial, like, um, yeah. for saying that it's evidence that it was like, um, that whether or not, you know, the, uh, the guilty verdict was correct, um, you can't ever completely know because of the amount of public pressure, right? Um, so they feel like maybe like if it's impossible that the jury didn't bow to some kind of public pressure, yeah. but, um, would you agree with that? Or are there ways that, um, you know, like the, you know, the defense lawyers and stuff made sure that the jury wasn't going to, going to do that? Like, I mean, you know, you, you do the best you can in situations like these, where this was obviously a very big national event. But nevertheless, uh, I think it's important to recognize that both parties had their part in the jury selection process, you know, and, and uh, certainly Derek Chauvin's attorneys did everything they could, uh, I have no doubt, to ensure that they got the best jury pool possible. Um, and, you know, uh, prosecutors did their part, uh, too, I'm sure, but... You know, the idea that that uh, they just took 12 random people and there were no uh, like when you're doing jury selection. Uh, mm. Well, sorry, maybe uh, you know, I was going to ask jury, about jury selection. Yeah. So this when you're doing a jury and again, I don't do jury trials, really. I'm not an expert on this, but just to give you kind of the, the law school take here. When you're doing juries, you don't just pick 12 random people off the street. Right. Both sides have the ability to uh, question the jurors in advance to see their views and to strike a number of jurors based on the responses they give and and there's also a limited number of what are called peremptory challenges which you can you can strike a jury for you know a juror for no reason or for yeah. without giving a reason um in fact let me let me uh let me make sure that's the uh, the one there yeah peremptory challenge a uh, made without needing to give a reason i don't know what the number is but you can you can do a certain number of those i don't think that uh 
I don't think that the, you know, I'm not sure what it is in um, Minnesota where it happened, um, but peremptory challenges are you know, part of the jury selection process. So yeah. even if you, you know, if you, for example, uh, just have a hunch that maybe somebody is very, you know, uh, is not uh, favorable, they won't give you a fair hearing. Yeah, you can, you can strike them. You're going to get right? rejected. So it's, uh, you know, the jury was, the defense had its opportunity here, I'm sure. And if it didn't for some reason, then that will come out during the inevitable appeal uh, yeah. and there will be an appeal. But the other claim I think that some people are making, which is that this jury was just hopelessly polluted by the media, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. by uh, this, you know, look at a certain point, you know, you do what you can, I suppose, with a national news story. But I think every effort was made in this trial, as in most trials, to get the fairest jury possible and... I, I, I doubt that a, a, you know, unless there's some uh, uh, element in jury selection I'm not aware of or, you know, something, uh, you know, that'll, you know, unless there's some technical issue, I don't know how successful that argument is going to be that the jury was hopelessly polluted because at a certain point, it sounds like their argument is basically that there could have been no jury, you know, which, you know, suggests there could have been, there's no jury that wouldn't have been biased, I think is kind of what the implication of the way the conservatives are arguing this would be. And yeah, I don't it think It seems like... Though. You know. Both the left and the right, like, um, tend to, you know, argue when it's useful for them that the American justice system is like very corrupt, um, and uh, and not and there's like you know no justice at all. Mm. Um, when is, I know um, like I know internationally, um, with I, w I was briefly in law school. <laughs> uh, we won't get mm -hmm. into that, but I know that um, uh, just internationally, when it comes to you know the scholarly view of law american law is kind of revered um mm. as being kind of like the best part about the united states or like the best kind of law around the world um so like would you which side do you kind of lean on i don't know i don't, I don't know if uh, american law is the best in the world i think our system is is good in a lot of ways i think an adversarial system probably gives people the better shot the best shot um you know compared to say the more inquisitorial system of uh you know, maybe countries like China or Japan or mm -hmm. France, you know, that have a less adversarial type uh, judicial process. But that said, um, oh my God, what the hell? Somebody in the chat just said, if I'm ever dying of a drug overdose, I hope a cop kneels on my neck to make it better. Desperate, shut up. What the f <laughs> are you even saying? Jesus Christ. Just time them out. Um, so... Uh, yeah, our, I think our adversarial system is good in that sense. But the United States, uh, our criminal justice system has a lot of very serious problems that maybe don't amount to corruption in the most base sense of paying for certain outcomes, but maybe even there. So uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, the, you know, the, this, this trial was probably about as fair as you can imagine because the guy got a very robust defense and, um, you know, he, he, uh, there was a video of what happened and on and on and on. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't based on, uh, you know, purely just the testimony of one witness or anything. Right. But, uh, I think it is important to recognize that, uh, criminal justice in the United States, for example, doesn't often lead to trials. I mean, most cases somewhere, I think north of 90% are resolved through plea bargains where prosecutors basically say, look, if you agree not to contest this guilty, uh, uh, you know, if you agree not to contest it, you know, if you agree to submit a guilty plea, don't contest this or go to trial, uh, you know, I'll give you three years instead of uh, the 30 that you're facing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that that's uh, that's a really coercive use of state power, you know. Um, and, you know, in exchange, uh, prosecutors have vast discretion to make those kinds of offers and judges really, uh, rarely question them. A lot of judges are former prosecutors as well. That's interesting. That's a big problem. Yeah. Um, our, uh, one of our guests recently, Clark Neely from the Cato Institute was telling us all about this. Um, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it just depends on what you're comparing us to. Like, is the United States better than China? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, but does the United States have more people imprisoned uh, than any other country in the world, maybe even China, depending on what the official figures are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for a free and liberal democracy, you know, given the difficulty with which we have in oversight of the police, uh, given the vast discretion that our prosecutors have to put people in mm -hmm. prison, basically, without 
without trials. Of course, they consent to this in a fashion, but given the state coercion used, uh, the consent is uh, questionable. You know, a lot of times people are willing to agree to anything just so that they don't have to, you know, lose uh, any hope of ever seeing their children again, you know? So that's one. And, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the folks that we look to to keep the system honest, judges, oftentimes just defer to police, defer to prosecutors. And the end result is that on top of that, we have a lot of over-criminalization of, of course, drugs, but, yeah. uh, you know, some other crimes. And the end result is a system that is bloated in terms of numbers that uh, ruins the lives of millions of people in this country, has a 66% uh, recidivism rate, uh, somewhere around mm. between 60 and 70% of people who are convicted of crimes will go back out and commit crimes after they are imprisoned. And apparently we saw a study yesterday from Jeremiah Johnson, the neoliberal project. He shared this study with us where they found that people convicted of misdemeanors are likelier to go out and convict and commit more crimes. So like, for example, if you bring somebody in for a misdemeanor and then you don't, you know, you don't charge them, you just let them go. Um, and you compare that group to people who are brought in for misdemeanors, charged, convicted. It does the opposite you know, effect of what we want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, convicting them me makes them more criminal. You know, putting them in prison and or jail makes them more criminal. So uh, clearly, we have a lot of problems. So obviously, we're better than, you know, say a state like a, a People's Republic of China, but we're certainly not leading the world with our criminal justice system. Our oh. our system of civil law, maybe you know, in other ways, but certainly criminal law. We we got a real mess going on. Yeah, I wonder if it has to do more with like the, you know, the more theory and the ideas behind American law that people, um, that scholars kind of revere and the actual, um, you know, versus, you know, the actual way that that's put into practice. Um, so maybe like, because I know one thing that American law is very revered about is, um, you know, presumption of in innocence. Like yeah. that's actually not as common in the West as people assume it is. Really? Um, yeah uh and um it, like in a ton of courts and on top of that um just a lot of the um the f um the rights that an accused has yeah. um just like idealistic uh, like ideology yeah. wise um yeah. like uh, pleading the fifth i'm pretty sure that's not a thing in most western countries you know that's the thing though super tragic about it, is that right we have all these rights but our system seems to sort of depend upon your ignorance of them in order mm -hmm. for it to properly and expeditiously process people and you know the police for example have the ability to lie to you um they have yeah you know basically that consequence yeah and it's uh you know if if we have a system that has a lot of rights and it doesn't but in practice you know most people don't use them because they're not aware of them or because the police are equipped and trained to uh sort of convince you to waive them that's uh that's rough. So I feel I share your uh, high idealism there. I think we have a lot of great things there. Um, but the uh, Ben Rabbi just said that is false. Tell me what's false about it and I'll correct it right now because I don't want to say anything false. Tell me what's wrong and false about what I just said and I'll correct it. <laughs> but what uh, I think, um, you know, I just, it, uh, you know, if most people don't go to trial because, again, 90% of this stuff is pled out. Yeah. Is that really a, you know, are they really getting the benefit of this? Yeah, it doesn't really sound right? like justice. One thing I remember hearing when I was in law school was some, uh, uh, some uh, professor lamenting, you know, look, we finally made trials good. You know, we finally have trials where, you know, if you go through the trial process, it's fair and it's effective uh, in, in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, we don't get as many wrongful convictions maybe as we used to and all that, but. But uh, look at this. Police cannot falsify evidence or coerce you. It is illegal. Ben Rabu, I said they can lie to you. That's very different from falsifying evidence or coercing. As for coercing, that yeah. is an, another issue that, as I have learned uh, to my detriment, uh, is certainly in the eye of the beholder. So it, uh, you know, uh, the police absolutely can lie to you, okay? And that's very different from saying falsifying evidence. But um, beyond that, uh, uh, beyond the lies that police are able legally to tell you, um, I guess what I would just say is what the professor was saying about trials is, look, we've made trials good. They're fair. They're, they're, we've, we've cut a lot of the racism out of trials, you know, uh, but we, you know, we also uh, just don't use them much anymore. And that's, you know, that's kind of sad. Um, it doesn't really do you much good to have all these rights if in practice they don't you know, mean much or they can't really be used or most people aren't aware of them um, on and on and on, you know, and it just kind of reminds me of like, yeah, the Soviet Union had a constitution, and certainly our constitution is more meaningful than, say, the 
you know, the, the Soviet constitution you know, in the sense of the rights yeah. and guarantees it had. But nevertheless, they had one that guaranteed uh, you know, a variety of rights. And um, I guess our rights and guarantees only mean so much as one, the state respects them through our involvement in the political process, kind of forcing it to respect them. And two, uh, you know, we can only argue our rights or cite them to the extent we're aware of them. And if we are not aware, or if we don't have the resources to hire a lawyer who is, or the knowledge to, I guess, you know, have a lawyer on retainer who can defend us if we get into a jam, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just well, doesn't I'll give you a dose much. of optimism um, yeah. that a lot of Americans, a lot of people like in general, don't realize how young America is. Like, yeah, you know, um, you know, relatively, like you guys are a very very young country um so in some ways it takes like look how long it took you know um uh england right and then you know mm -hmm. the british empire and all that stuff um to get to you know the points that they're at um and stuff and so compared to most nations i would say that yeah. it's certainly possible that like you guys have the right intentions or ideas behind it but you know Oh, yeah. Through moments yeah, I, like this, yeah. right? Like you might be moving towards a better direction in the future. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I think uh, the United States in some very important ways is doing much better than maybe any other country in the world, particularly freedom of speech, which even our allies in Canada and Britain and Australia, particularly Australia and Britain, Canada's pretty close. I and mean, Canada's really, you know, probably right up there with us, but not quite. It's, you can still, um, you know, have hate speech laws and things like that. And so I know you're, that you're a, against hate speech laws. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm against all these restrictions on freedom of speech. The United States does it does it right. That's one area that the United States absolutely does right. Um, because you know, it, it to to have any consistent standards here, you uh, I don't think you really can have any consistent standards on this. So what do you end up doing? You just end up banning unpopular opinions. And look, I don't like unpopular opinions any more than anybody else, except when they're my opinions. But you know, to have the state jail you for spreading them is pretty insane, I think. And in Australia and Britain, they go even further. Australia apparently doesn't even have an analog to any kind of First Amendment or guarantee of freedom of speech. In Britain, they jailed that other guy. Uh, they jailed this Nazi uh, from Scotland or somebody because he 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 taught his uh, his his dog to do a Nazi salute. You know, uh, they uh, have the police call yeah, and warden that. people over posts they make on social media. And it's just it's really insane to to think that the government is out here trying to enforce. You know, trying trying to enforce uh, uh, these kinds of uh, you know uh, socio political kind of standards. You know, I think it's I think it's bad, and I'm glad the U.S. really doesn't have so much of that. We still fall short sometimes, but we're doing good on that. We're doing good uh, on on uh, so First Amendment. We're doing good on that free speech. We're doing good on Second Amendment, guaranteeing uh, people's rights to to defend themselves with firearms if they're so inclined. Uh, Third Amendment doesn't get much credit. That's kind of a uh, legacy of King George there, but it's, you know, it's, I don't think we've had any Third Amendment violations. That's the, the one that says soldiers cannot be quartered in your home uh, without, uh, gosh, I don't want to say Third Amendment. Oh, that's a great I, I forget one. if it's, let me see, Third Amendment, uh, I forget if it's uh, wartime. Let's see. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a massive, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but anyway, uh, that one, uh, doesn't really get much press that one. I don't know that that one's, uh, yeah. every so often somebody will come up with a kind of a zany, a third amendment. Yeah. I didn't even know what the third amendment was. Yeah. So. It's the one in between the second and the fourth, you know, they get a lot of, they get a lot yeah. of press, you know, but anyway, uh, so we got a lot of good amendments there, but, um, I think with criminal justice, we fall short but with political freedom. I think we do very well. And, um, you know, we've, uh, I think America is, uh, on a, on an upward trajectory. I think we're doing, we're doing well and I, we're doing better. I think that well, we were. Well, you seem kind and, of like uh, a patriot, right? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I don't know if you're a nationalist and I don't even know what the official definition difference is between the two, yeah. but patriot sounds nicer. <laughs> um, well, but, yeah. uh, I'll, so, I'll try and split the difference there if you're interested. Um, well, what, is that like a main, I guess, yeah. What, what's the main difference to you between being a nationalist and a patriot? I think the difference is the nationalist views their country as, uh, you know, uh, being one that is based on innate and immutable characteristics, like ethnicity in particular, is superior to all the others and deserves very special and unique consideration over all the others. Or I imagine a, a patriotic type person like myself does not view their nation 
as being uh, kind of an exclusive club that nobody else can mm-hmm. join. But they only have to be born. They can only be born into. Is based on Im- innate, immutable characteristics like uh, race or ethnicity, or maybe sometimes religion. All that's not exactly immutable, but uh, you know, rather than being that, uh, I I would uh, use the word patriotic because I think our country, and I can't speak for others, but I only speak for ours, is one that I think is more united by sort of abstract ideas, and I, I think that's a good thing. You know, civic values, civic virtues, the idea of individual freedom. The idea of being able to live your life in accordance with your values, so long as you uh, follow the law. You know, and is that what attracted the, you? Is that what attracted you to law um, as a career? Um, no, a actually, uh, when, I, when I was a kid, uh, my dad said, "You know, look, uh, look, little bastard, you, uh, you know, you got to, uh, you got to, uh, you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer, and uh, <laughs> you don't seem very interested in helping people, so you better be a lawyer." And so I went from there. Yeah, also, I, was, I, thought I was raised be, with the same shit. So um. also, I thought it would be interesting, you know, just to uh, I thought it'd be interesting, you know, interesting career. You know, that's really why I, I went for it. But. Well, why did you end up going into corporate law? Was it just because I know that's obviously where yeah. most of the, the most money yeah. is besides maybe like insurance law. I don't mm-hmm. know. But. It's all right. You know, really, the, uh, the thing is just that I, uh, I feel like uh, it's interesting, challenging work. And I thought I was going to be a prosecutor. But when I uh, oh. when I went to law school, I uh, I sort of adopted some of the positions that I currently hold, and I decided I would not want to participate in our criminal justice system, at least to the extent I wouldn't want to participate in prosecuting people, particularly for drug offenses. And I just decided I I didn't want to do that, and I also didn't want to be a defense attorney because I'm just not really that interested. In, I'm also just not that interested in criminal law after having been exposed to some of it. Yeah. And so I, you know, decided I wanted to do the corporate thing, and I, I, uh, I enjoy it. That's cool. Um, well, thanks for coming, like, for this interview. It was really cool to get to talk. Um, it, it, I don't hear people with your perspective a lot, um, and it was cool to actually get to talk to a real Neil Lib, and I could see like memes on Reddit. Um, well, and I, I feel like say, you do a really yeah. good job at you know demonstrating that point of view in a rational way. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Eris. I want—I just want to say—I really appreciate talking with you. I know I rambled a lot, but it was a no, lot of fun. No, you're welcome to ramble. It was a lot of fun talking with you. You asked really—I I really like the questions you asked, and I really oh, enjoyed just you. kind of your your uh, kind of uh, uh, being, you know, kind of sticking to kind of a, a rough outline, but you know, also being a little flexible with where we go. So I just really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed kind of uh, interacting with you when we cross paths on Twitch, and uh, I, I just hope you yeah. keep on. Yeah, we with have had a good conversations before. I enjoy it. Can I ask you one question? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, do it. Okay. What's uh, what what got you doing the uh, the VTuber thing? Um, honestly, it was like out of necessity because yeah. I, um, my viewers know this, but like I I actually have never watched anime. I think the only thing I've seen is like uh, Sailor Moon. Um, yeah. for me the uh, oh, thank you so much. Uh, someone just gifted me a sub to you. Yeah. Um, thanks for that little bit. Uh, but yeah, the main thing for me was I got into like the whole debating universe. Now I'm kind mm-hmm. of like getting out of it because I'm a little exhausted from it. Um, yeah. But I got into the whole debating universe by debating Nazis on Holocaust denial. So because oh, that's why I yeah. study history. So I was like really into I, I had this very naive idea of, oh, they just don't know the facts. So yeah. I'll just teach them the facts. And then they, there won't be Holocaust deniers anywhere because yeah. they're actually you're not allowed to deny the Holocaust in Canada. Yeah. So I never get to meet them. So there was like this curiosity and yeah. I don't know over time I kind of built a um, both a positive reputation in some circles and a very negative reputation in Nazi circles um, mm-hmm. and yeah there's been a lot of efforts to like dox me and all this stuff mm-hmm. so I've just because I started in that universe um, mm-hmm. uh, I made like a commitment to being as anonymous as I could um, yeah just to protect myself especially I'm I'm not I'm like Jewish and Asian so I'm like yeah. everything that they hate um, in a lot of ways uh, so yeah so that's why oh. for me it was just about having you know just trying to protect some parts of myself as much as possible yeah. no I respect that I mean, I mean it, feel, it feels like VTubers are the future so uh, you, know, you, <laughs> yeah, are, you, you are the bleeding edge here I'm uh, trying to improve my avatar whatever. right now because I know she's like she's very stable um, uh, the artist who drew her, her is um, like 
there's actually like a lot of things that she can do and move around and she actually looks really cool when she moves around but mm -hmm. um the software that i'm using really sucks so i'm trying to write mm -hmm. better software to improve it um but yeah, yeah it's taking taking some time right on yeah i gotta get one one of these days you know i mean i just feels like the direction the market is moving in you know and i certainly wouldn't question the wisdom you wouldn't have to put on a suit every day right that's um, true that's no i wouldn't have to i could yeah. be doing this uh, you know, you totally make it make as it. a jaybird yeah. right, yep. you know? anyway all right thank you so much uh for your time Harrison. yeah thank you so thanks for, for coming opportunity to chat with you we'll see you take care